You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. What about Peter? Uh, why would we want to study Peter? And I think it's an excellent study for both young and for old. Oh, while I'm thinking about young and old, colouring in. Don't forget colouring in pages, kids. I believe this is for kids that are six and under and 60 and over. Is that right? <laughs> Not quite sure. But anyway, there's a couple of little colouring in little things there to keep you occupied during the night if, you know, you sort of drift off a little bit. But anyway, why study Peter? Great study. He's a great role model. And I think for all of us, Interesting, we all tend to identify with Peter. You know, we look at all the other apostles, Philip and Andrew, we say, oh, yeah, well, they're, they're all interesting. John, maybe. But, you know, somehow we all identify with Peter. Well, I'm actually going to challenge that uh, and, and, and really ask the question, well, do we have the passion and the love that Peter had for Christ? I mean, that's going to be the overarching question, really, for our weekend. So he's a great role model. Uh, he had an incredible life, loyalty for Christ. It's inspiring. It emboldens us to commit to reaching a higher level of vibrant faith and leadership. So role model, really important in today's world, uh, especially when we've got great characters from the Bible. So we're going to learn about a bit of his character, some of his attributes, and we're going to, well, we want to connect to them. Of course we do. It's why we're here. Secondly, to be encouraged when times are tough. We're going to have a lot of situations where Peter went through and he just despaired of what was happening around him and maybe inside of himself as well. And he said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not who I should be. And I think for all of us, we go through, you know, the ups and downs of life. And sometimes times are tough for us. But Peter has that persistency that he pushes through. He clings to his master. You know, he survives. He modifies his own personality so that it is more like Christ. And that's where we want to be as well. And finally, and this is probably something we don't always think about to reflect on the great love that Jesus had for Peter. You know, it wasn't just that there were 12 disciples wandering around be behind Christ and he had his face steadfastly set to the crucifixion of the cross. He needed these men and one person that really inspired Jesus was Peter himself. We're going to have a look at a couple of comments that Peter makes that actually lift Jesus up in times when he himself was struggling as far as his own popularity and ministry was concerned. So four snapshots of Peter's life is not enough, but, you know, it's only a weekend. <laughs> so uh, confession by the seashore, this is the one, the indifferent listener. We're going to see how that Jesus really had to draw Peter towards himself. You know, Peter was sort of a little bit distracted at the beginning, but once he found his pathway, he grasped hold of Christ and wouldn't let him go. Uh, tomorrow we'll have a look at confidence on the mountain, the affirmative supporter. So, of course, this was... Uh, a a monumental change, an instant in the life of Peter where he became an eyewitness of the transformation of Christ and he writes about it in his epistle that that was a pivotal moment in his life that reinforced who Jesus really was. Uh, commotion in the upper room, the devoted disciple. We'll see how Peter wanted to please Christ. He detected that there was you know, some pressure on the Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted to be close to him. Uh, and, of course, he made some wonderful and encouraging statements. And then, of course, confusion in the garden, the bewildered defender. He put himself right out there and he didn't quite meet his own expectations. So, you know, what's going to be the outcome for Peter? So, as we say, you know, we're going to start off with this little picture on the, um, on the seashore there, the Sea of Galilee, uh, where from our reading, of course, we've been uh, looking at some of the issues that Peter's going to face as far as fishing is concerned. So, you know, we might have this over, overview of Peter that he was quite an erratic person, that he's random in his comments and that he was impetuous. Now, I'm gonna, I want to erase all that <laughs> and I want to replace it with a more appropriate word. Peter was not impulsive. He was passionate about Jesus, all right, and a big difference. There's a big difference just being, you know, impulsive and saying anything that comes in your head or actually have a direction and a pathway. And the correct understanding of Peter's character is, number one, he was passionate for Jesus. And we'll see that unfold as we unpack some of the lessons of his life. 
So, you know, that, that I think is a, a key word as far as the character of Peter is concerned. So, he had an unquestionable devotion and love for Christ. You know, while you might think he had lots of ups and downs, and we all do, and even our Lord Jesus Christ did, there's one thing that stands out, and it's very powerful, uh, his unquestionable devotion. He wanted to be alongside of the Lord. And we'll see that, you know, when he gets out of the boat. Uh, he wants to go to the Lord Jesus Christ. So quite inspiring, quite amazing. Secondly, uh, he was a man of action, not just talk. Okay, when you look at all the disciples, you know, even Thomas, there's conversations that, that happen. There's a bit of doubting on the part of Thomas. You know, where are we all going with this? Um, but he wasn't just a talking person. I mean, I guess we know in our ecclesia, people that are really good talkers. You know, I sort of have a picture of a couple of people I know. They're really good talkers, mostly on committees, you know, that never, nothing ever really gets done. Got lots of great ideas that then they sort of seem to fade away pretty quickly. What's well, not Peter? Yeah, what he said, he carried out. Uh, so, again, very inspiring. Oh, he's honest, transparent sort of person. You know, he didn't put up this facade of, well, you know, I'm more superior than you. Uh, he got down to ground level and he realised, and personalised, we're going to have times when we're confronted with our own failures. We don't have to be disappointed in ourselves. We've just got to bounce back up like Peter did. So as far as Peter was concerned, you know, there's some uh, uh, great little qualities there. Now, the timeline is sort of interesting because we tend to think, oh, okay, Peter's being called at the beginning of the ministry of Christ. Well, no, over a year has already gone. This is Luke chapter 5, all right? So here we've got the lifeline of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the Passover's three-and-a-half-year ministry. Okay, so this is where we are here. Um, it's already almost three-quarters of the way through the, the first year of Christ's ministry. So there's an introduction there, and sort of uh, this is where we're sitting here at Luke chapter 5. So this is really Peter's third calling. And then, of course, it follows on from here. There's a number of events we'll talk about when he walks on the water, his confession, the transfiguration, and his denial. So what we, when we're setting the narrative for this particular chapter here and this particular event, don't think it's like right at the beginning of Christ's ministry. Over a year has already gone by, and Jesus now is getting serious about calling his disciples uh, to commitment. Now, as far as Peter's position uh, on the, on the line of all the disciples, again, this is quite interesting. I mean, I guess we know this, but he wasn't the first person to be called. All right, so there's, there's Philip and Andrew. Uh, but when we look at the, the listing of how the disciples are listed in the record, quite amazingly, quite wonderfully, I'd say, Peter heads the list. Um, and again, we've just got the comment here. He, he wasn't the first to confess Jesus or the first to be called. That's um, Philip and Andrew there. But, you know, he is positioned. Now, why is that? It's because he's close to Christ and our Lord Jesus Christ appreciated him. And again, when we run this sort of down, uh, the, the number of records of the disciples themselves, this is where we get, of course, John. Well, he's fairly prominent. He's at 48. Uh, John the Baptist at 90. The Apostle Paul at 185. Simon Peter comes in at 191. I don't know who's going to explain that to the Apostle Paul, you know, in the kingdom that he actually just dipped below Peter. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the numbers there in the scripture. So quite prominent, you know, above and beyond John, who, of course, Jesus loved as well. Uh, and his preeminence was certainly significant. Now, a couple of other little things we need to reflect on too. No apostle is mentioning the gospels often of Peter. Well, we've just, we've just shown that. So that makes him quite prominent. No apostle speaks to or is spoken to by Jesus as often as Peter. So there's lots of conversations that go on between Peter and Christ. So it shows the closeness of that relationship. No one confessed Christ more boldly or denied him more defensively. So again, Peter put himself right out there. This is where I want to be. You know, the other disciples who don't hear much of their conversation. No one was praised or blessed by Jesus like Peter. Remember, we're going to have a look at one of these instances where Jesus praises Peter for his knowledge and understanding of who the Messiah was. So, you know, these fishermen weren't just ignorant people, and, and we'll see where Peter actually is very perceptive in some of the discourses of Christ, and he makes some profound statements. No one else had the courage to rebuke the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, who stood up to Christ? Who said to Jesus, no, you're not going to Jerusalem. It's not appropriate. You shouldn't be doing that. Look after yourself. 
Well, Peter did because he was that sort of person. Uh, but no other apostle is rebuked as sharply or as often as Peter, and he's called and he's called Satan by Christ as well. So we're going to have a look at that. Uh, but that was helpful to to Peter because it changed the direction uh, of where he understood Christ was going. So Peter, of course, was born as we know originally in Bethsaida. Um, he was living in Capernaum, so their towns are very close together up on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, with his brother Andrew, they were in a fishing business, obviously, James and John as well, sons of Zebedee. What's important as we open up the record of Peter and our first uh, instant of him is not that he was some sort of bishop or some sort of pastor or some sort of earl or some sort of deacon. He's a fisherman. All right, so this is quite wonderful for us because... Many of us don't have high qualifications in today's world. Uh, and of course, we come from sort of fairly average backgrounds. And this is so wonderful about Peter. This is where he comes from as well. Jesus was calling ordinary men to walk an ordinary life, but with extraordinary service, we might say. And so Peter comes from that background. He's called to service and he's following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. So. So what's Peter doing here in chapter 5? Well, let's have a look at verse 1. And here's the great point out of verse 1. Luke chapter 5 said, It came to pass as the people pressed upon him. Now, I love this next phrase. I've got it circled in my Bible. To hear the word of God. Okay, so it wasn't that Jesus is some sort of charismatic leader that was doing amazing miracles and people are, are drawn to some sort of amazing entertainment. People are pressing on Jesus to hear what thing? What thing? the word of God. They wanted the reassurance that there was a plan and purpose in their world. And Jesus was the one who was talking about, you know, the rabbis, the Pharisees were all talking about, you know, the different theories that 15 different rabbis had. People would come away confused thinking, I don't know even what that means. Whereas Jesus would expound the word of God with clarity. So the people were giving serious weight to the teachings of Christ. That's why they were there. And they were laying, they were pressing, that's what the word says, they were pressing upon him to hear that word. Now, what's Simon doing? Well, Simon's, um, well, he's fixing the nets up. <laughs> and Simon means hearing, all right? Simon means hearing. So he wasn't really listening to, to what was going on because um, the record there in verse 2 says that, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. So here's Jesus preaching the word of God and people are pressing, they want to hear it. And over here are the fishermen. Well, you know what? They're fixing their nets up. So there's a disconnection here initially, isn't there? And of course, uh, here is, is Simon. His name means hearing. And we know that the Lord Jesus Christ actually changed his name to Peter or Cephas. Peter in the Greek, Cephas in the Aramaic. And uh, the record there, of course, in uh, John chapter 1, where there is this first connection it says that Jesus beheld Peter. And the word is not like he just looked at him or glanced, or, oh, Peter, how are you? It's like look right into his heart. Because this word beheld here in Luke 1 is the same word here in Luke 22. Remember when Peter went out, he was crying because he denied the Lord Jesus Christ. And he comes in, he's got tears down his face, and Jesus comes out and just looks at him. And that transformed Peter into a different life. So it's the same word there. It means to look deeply. And so Christ looked into the heart of Peter and he saw something that was rock solid. That was devotion, passion and commitment. And so uh, he, he renamed him from Simon, which means hearing, to Cephas or Peter, which means you know rock. And that's certainly what Peter was going to become. What's interesting, of course, is the, his original name is Cephas. And we think, well, why? You know, obviously that's the Aramaic. What's interesting is the Apostle Paul uh, this is the only time the word Cephas occurs and the Apostle Paul always uses the word Cephas to talk about Peter and you sort of think, I wonder why that was, that's unusual, why didn't he call him Peter? Why did he write Cephas? Well, we've got here, it only occurs in Paul's writings, perhaps to show his respect for the great man and his a Jewish connection to Christ. So Cephas, of course, in the, the Aramaic uh, is who he was. And then he reaffirms the distinctive title of Christ and giving him, you know, the rock. So, you know, there's this uh, invitation that's going on now and Jesus is going to get serious with these disciples. 
12 months has roughly gone by of his ministry. He now needs to bring these disciples on board and start to educate them uh, on the pathway to the cross. So he's going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Peter and he's going to encourage Peter to become part of this group of disciples. So what's the conversation? Verse 4, when he had left speaking, he's having a one-on-one -on -one with, with, uh, with Peter, with Simon. What does he say? Launch out into the deep. Right, so I'm just going to pause on that. Again, I've just this word deep uh, circled in my verse 4 because it's very meaningful to me. Christ challenges us to get out of the shallows. So, you know, you can be on the beach and you can be in shallow water and can throw you in the out, pull some fish in. Christ is saying, get out into the deep, Peter. And he challenges us to do that as well. We get, all, we get very comfortable in ecclesial life, don't we? You know, we come in on a Sunday or a Wednesday whenever our study class is, we sit on a chair, we listen to a talk and we go home and we're pretty comfortable with life in the truth. Jesus says, get out into the deep. Well, what does that mean? Well, for me, it was mission work. I mean, obviously with COVID, we haven't been able to do that, but I remember going to China the first time and that was really, really scary for me because it was just me and Beth on our own. New country, you know, strange looking people. I mean, I guess they looked at us and thought we look strange, but, you know, you're out there doing something different. And so this is the challenge of Christ to all of us in ecclesial life. Do something uncomfortable. You know, don't just sit on a chair, put your hand up to be on a committee or, you know, be a chairman or to give a talk or to be in the Sunday school. You know, these are all challenges for us. So what Jesus is saying to Peter right now is he's saying, Peter, you need to take the truth, you need to take me seriously. And maybe we need that lesson as well. Maybe we sort of hang around, you know, half listening to some of the talks we hang around with more of our friends and there's things that we've got to do you know maybe fix up nets or something else you know similar parallel so we may be content with where we're sitting right here and now but maybe jesus is not maybe he wants to prompt and push us into areas that we feel very uncomfortable in and that's the challenge of the truth we want to change don't we <laughs> we don't want to just be the person that we always have been we want to expand and explore and modify our character so it's more like christ and Christ was certainly dealing with the deep in the things that he went through in, in life. So he tells Peter in verse 4 to launch out into the deep, which Peter does. And of course, you know, we know what happens. He pulls in a massive harvest of fish. You know, this is after he's had a conversation with Christ and said, hey, you know, you're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. Like, I know what I'm doing. And we've been out all night. I'm not going to take advice from a carpenter as to how to fish. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that conversation went that way, but, you know, I'm just painting it up a bit. So he went out and he was just astounded at the harvest of fish. Now, verse 8 is the response. Uh, verse 7, it filled the ships and they began to sink. I mean, this is a pretty impressive lesson, right? Now, look at verse 8. Now, this is there's something really strange and unique about verse 8. It says, when Simon Peter saw it, now don't say the fish, All right, he's not looking at the fish, do not say them or the fish, he saw it, what does he say? Wow, this is amazing, look at all this fish, that's incredible, what a great miracle. No, what he says was depart from, I'm a sinful person. How, how does that co-relate? Because that's a moral comment, isn't it? He just pulled in a lot of fish and he comes before the Lord and he says, I'm not, I'm not worthy to be a disciple. So, you know, how does this connect? Because he realised that Christ saw into his heart. He actually realised that Christ read his thoughts. Okay, so when Christ says, Peter, get in your boat, take those nets, go out to the deep, what was Peter thinking? He's thinking, hey, you know, why would I listen to this man? And then when it all happens, he comes back in, he says, I'm a sinful man. Those were wrong thoughts. So this is a stunning realisation for Peter that the man he's talking to is the Messiah indeed who can read hearts and minds and thoughts. That, that's the transformation there. It's not just that there's a bucket load of fish in the boat. He's not impressed with that at all. I read an article, which I guess this sort of adds another level. I read an article that says the value of the fish, and it said fill two boats, the value of the fish was between 12 and 18 years wages for each of the four men. 
they didn't have to do anything for the next 12 or 18 years because they just pulled in two fish loads that would, you know, when the sale of that would last them for, for 12 to 18 years. Amazing. But that's not what Peter was impressed with. He was impressed with the mind of the Messiah. So this conversation was a clincher for Peter. And you know what? There were two boatloads of fish that they walked away from. They left it for, I don't know, the apprentices or whoever to, you know, sell them and clean all the fish. They just walked away and followed Christ. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So this was a point where Peter realised that this man wasn't just a rabbi. He actually had a greater depth to his teachings and, he, and his ministry, and he believed he was the Messiah. So here we've got an instance where Peter is the very first person to confess his sinfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly that was a moment of transformation for Peter. And I do like this little comment here by Brother A.D. Norris. He says, there's little rock-like in the spectacle of Peter on his knees. But then there was a little kingly in that of Jesus' faith in Gethsemane. Both marked the right preparation for high office. I mean, in Gethsemane, did Jesus look like a king? No way. He, he was struggling with, with what was ahead of him. So Peter's contrition and Jesus' surrender both speak of hearts that would not hold back any glory from God when the final trials and triumphs should come. Only in this way can the firm foundation of God's purposes be laid. Peter, I love this little phrase, Peter, who knew how to kneel. He knew how to kneel would adopt that position in laying the true foundation stone for other men to build on. So, you know, here's our first snapshot of Peter. He's a man that was overwhelmed with his own inadequacies before Christ. And he was down on his knees before the Lord. That's pretty amazing. I mean, that's where we, we all start off, don't we, I guess, in some ways. And maybe we need to revisit that spot every now and again, regularly probably, because we're all inadequate. And certainly Peter realised that. So he understood the miracle. It wasn't just the fish. It was the privilege of calling Peter to discipleship. So that's why he's saying he's unworthy of the Lord, because the Lord's saying, Peter, you know, forget the fishing business. I've got a task for you. And Peter, I, I just don't think I can do this. I'm not worthy. I'm just a fisherman. I don't even, you know, I, this is an amazing calling. So he worried about his own unworthiness. He didn't have the stamina, he didn't have the wisdom, he didn't have the education to be a disciple of Christ. Maybe we're the same, brothers and sisters and young people. Um, maybe we're content to be who we are, just in the little environment that we're in, and we're not reaching out to follow Jesus more specifically and more closely. You know, we live with all the... Uh, failures of our life and we're okay with that but Christ calls us to greater service and more faithful following and that can be uncomfortable it can be frightening to us it can be painful and it can be maturing and it was in the life of Peter this is a great call this is a marking point of now where he leaves his business behind and we notice in verse 11 Again, quite an interesting statement there. When they had brought their ships to land, you know, we just read this. They forsook all and they followed him. Um, you know, that was a big marking point in their life. Thayer says that word means to abandon, to let go or to leave. So whatever is there remains. So this is a massive move for Peter. He didn't procrastinate. Did he say, well, let me go home to my wife. We know he had a wife and my mother-in-law, uh, you know, and I've got to sort of organise things there, and when that's all organised, then I'll come and follow you. No, nah, he, he just followed after the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he had that ability to change and to realise what was to be a priority in his life, and that was very decisive. So here's the point for us. Their occupations became the second priority in their lives. Following Jesus became the main priority. Now, Let's think about our own lives. What's, what's first priority in our life? Is it our education? Is it our position? You know, do we put off studying the Word of God well because, you know, uh, I've got to spend some time doing dot, 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 or, you know, I've got a lot of overtime, I can earn more money, uh, and we need more money, so I know I could go to the, the um, study class or, I, you know, 
I've got to skip a few Sunday mornings because uh, I've got to work. So, see, Peter didn't look at it that way. He said, first priority is following Christ. Uh, and that, that was the realm that they followed. And I wonder whether for us, you know, maybe that's something that we need to think about as well. So Peter's uh, making a, a stand now and a priority for following Jesus. He leaves all his occupation behind and now he's full-time ministering and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're looking at his personality. He had the, the good raw material there. This is what Jesus is looking for. He was passionate. You know, the way he talked to Christ, the way he was honest and transparent, the way he looked at himself, he was passionate about everything. He had the right life experiences. He's toughened by, you know, all, all the storms on the Lake of Galilee, repairing nets and all those sorts of things. He had the right attitude. He was humble enough when, when he was challenged. He had the right recovery process. He didn't just discard and, and say, well, you know what? Uh, I'm unworthy to be a disciple of Christ. I'm just going to go back to my nets and my fishing. No, he, he, he mulled over it, he thought over it, and he recognised what was particularly important. Uh, it was the right response. You know, was he ever perfect? Well, I've got Galatians 2 there, and of course, remember, there was a bit of a discussion between the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter, and Paul said, Peter, you've done it wrong. You know, you've connected through with the, the, the Jewish segment of the ecclesia and discarded the Gentiles. So there was a bit of a a dispute in Galatians chapter 2. So Peter was not perfect, and none of us are. You know, we're all a work in progress. But we need to give diligence, and this is the lesson. So we want to come across to the second incident, which is Matthew chapter 14. And uh, this is another year's gone by, so we're sort of jumping fairly rapidly through the life of the Apostle Peter. Uh, and we're coming to, to Matthew chapter 14. There's only 12 months now to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ because John chapter 6 fits in here as well. So the last Passover, and there's 12 months now uh, to the crucifixion of Christ. So there's lots of lessons that are happening in this final 12 months. Back in John, we're not going to go to John, John 6.15, uh, it said that the people wanted to take Jesus by force and make him a king. So, you know, there was an ascending popularity of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can imagine Peter and the disciples soaking it all in, thinking, you know, wow, this is a good choice. Um, Jesus is going to be king and we're going to help distill his teachings through the nation. So they wanted to take Jesus by force and make him a king. So, of course, the preaching of the 5,000, Gospel record, four gospel records record all of that. And of course, on the background of feeding the 5,000 was the incident of the death of John the Baptist. So you can imagine the pressure that Christ was under. You know, just amazing circumstances swirling around in his mind. But again, number one priority for Christ was looking after the people who were like sheep without a leader. So when we come to Matthew 14, verse 14, You'll see, you know, if you wind back into the narrative there about verse 11, 10, 11, 12, you'll see there's the death of John the Baptist, right? Six months different in age between Christ and John the Baptist, Jesus knew within 12 months he was going to go through something even worse. Jesus wants some solitude. But, you know, the people, verse 14, uh, follow him and uh, he was very sensitive to the needs of other people. So... Just an exhausting day, feeding 5,000, the sun's going down. And Jesus needs that time with his father. He needs to sort of replenish himself. And so he's desperate for prayer and connection to his God in this time of great distress. So what does he do? Verse 22. And you'll notice these words straightway. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. In fact, I think I've got an overhead here that sort of highlight this sense of urgency on the part of Christ. He'd taken care of the people, and now he needed to take care of himself. And he puts his disciples in a boat and says, you know, off to um, Bethsaida. And so uh, you've got constrained his disciples. He sent, he sent, he went, he went. There's, there's a decision there. In fact, it's similar. I've just got the note there of Acts 20, verse 13. Remember the Apostle Paul did exactly the same. Went up to Troas. Eutychus fell out. Uh, he had to re revive uh, Eutychus. It was sort of a miracle. He kept talking all through the night. And then it says the next day, see, this is Paul was not unaffected. He said the next day, Paul put the disciples that were with him in a boat and he walked because he wanted to think things through. So, you know, these men weren't just 
unaffected by all the circumstances that were happening around. So a very you know, similar situation with the Apostle Paul. So for Christ, it's imperative that you know, he had this moment. And in this next circumstance, which is the one we know, you know very familiar with, the disciples in the boat, storm comes, we've done it at Sunday school. But there's three important principles that Christ is now teaching the disciples. Because number one, put this in the back of your mind, Jesus could have calmed the storm, right? It says he, he's up on the mountains and he saw the disciples labouring in the boat. Could have stopped the storm, but he didn't. Why? Why? Why did he let these men labour on through the night, seemingly getting, getting nowhere? Because he's going to teach them three important techniques when you're under pressure. It's about praying, it's about persevering, and it's about participating together. I guess that's, you know, it really crystallises ecclesial life. Like if you want to boil it right down to three important techniques of how to deal with stress, it's those three. Pray, persevere and participate together. Uh, and so we notice in verse 23, it says there, when he sent them away, he was alone and he went into the mountain um, to pray. Well, I guess we sort of know the story because verse 24 talks about the storm. It talks about a ship being tossed. It says the, the wind was contrary. In fact, that word tossed there is the Greek word basanizo, and it means to torment or to harass. So it's a very strong Greek word, and it's used in relation to legion, the schizophrenic man. Remember in Luke 8, verse 28, he says to Jesus, torment me not. And it's that same word, torment. So here's this man you know, with a disturbed mind, and he's saying, don't torment me. And this is the same word metaphorically that's used for this storm. So in some ways, it's describing... So the minds of the disciples, they were all disturbed. What's going on? Jesus is popular, uh, but now he's put us in a boat and he's gone off on his own. What's going on? So, you know, perhaps Peter and the other disciples are, are wondering where this is all going and then suddenly this, this storm happens. And for the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, he needed that quiet time alone. The record in Mark says he saw them toiling in rowing. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a great distance. I mean, when you know the, the Sea of Galilee, uh, it's only 13 k's wide. I think it's about 23 or something long. So it's not a massive area. But they were getting nowhere. He saw them toiling and he didn't dissipate the storm as he could have done. He could have said, peace be still, and that didn't happen. So no, have a look at verse 25. And I always find this quite amazing. Verse 25 says... And in the fourth watch, so what time would that be? So, you know the Romans divided the day into four segments, four watches, and the night. So this will be 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Right, this is the fourth watch. This is just before sunrise. So he goes around about the fourth watch between the hours of 3 and 6 in the morning. So when you calculate back, these disciples have been rowing for at least eight hours. Like I would have turned back. I was just gone with the gone with the wind, you know, floated to wherever. They've been rowing for eight hours non-stop. It's pretty amazing, but it shows the fortitude that these men had. That's why Christ loved them. It's why he chose them. John 6 and verse 19 actually gives the distance. It says they went between 25 and 30 furlongs. That's four to five Ks. That's all. You know, you normally do that in a sailboat probably in an hour. So eight hours rowing all night and still headed toward the destination that Jesus told them to go to. Why did Jesus allow this to happen? Because he's developing that quality of persistence. He's strengthening, we might say, the spiritual backbone of these disciples. They're laboring unrelentingly in the storm. And this is what he asks of us, brothers and sisters. I don't know what's going on in your life. Sometimes we have these massive storms, these blow up out of nowhere. I think, how, how am I going to deal with this? And it sort of destabilizes us. And sometimes we just throw it in and say, I'll oh, just run with the storm. But not these disciples. Jesus was training them. And I'm going to point out a little bit in Acts where a similar situation happens. And they applied the three techniques that Christ uh, gave to them. So we have quotations like Hebrews 10 23 that says, Hold fast without wavering because he's faithful that promised. So this is the whole point for us, isn't it? We go through disturbances in life 
and the common is by Christ, and in this case by the Apostle Paul, hold fast without wavering. There's a destination that we have to reach, and sometimes the storms are almost impenetrable, but we've got to build that spiritual backbone uh, to reach our ultimate destination. Well, very beautifully in verse 25, there are some lessons here. Verse 25 says, Jesus uh, went unto them walking by the sea. Now, Mark 6 and verse 48 adds, and would have passed them by. So what's the point of that? So what it's telling us that Jesus didn't stop the storm, nor did he remain isolated from the disciples. He was in the vicinity. Okay, this is the point. And this is probably what we need to realize that when we're in the middle of a storm, we're not alone. Oh, Jesus and the Father hasn't disconnected and sort of, well, let's see how they go on their own. They're in the vicinity. So we sometimes wonder, you know, is, is anyone with me to help me, to support me? I need, need support. And, of course, the greatest support is our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's always in the vicinity. I mean, he loves us. He has compassion. He wants us to develop into people who have faith and fortitude. So, you know, he, he comes on the water. Now, what does he say? In verse 27, be of good cheer. Now, I always find that quite almost amusing, like, hello. I've been rowing for eight hours. Be of good cheer. You know, I'd, I'd be throwing my paddle out or my oar or whatever I've got. So, well, you know, yeah, cheers to that. <laughs> but what Jesus was saying, essentially not, you know, be cheerful. He's saying, take courage. He's saying, take courage. He actually says the same thing in John 16, 33. He won't go there but it's on the way to Gethsemane. And this is what he says. These things have I spoken unto you that you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Exactly the same. Jesus is just going to go into another storm. Well, it's Gethsemane, the crucifixion. And he says, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Like if there's faith and fortitude, it's definitely in the mind of Christ there. What Jesus is also teaching him is that second technique we talked about, uh, well, the third, third one was participation, work together in the storm. Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is an important aspect. Now, the Egyptian hieroglyphic for impossible, interesting, is a person walking on water. <laughs> so that's sort of interesting. That's the figure for the word impossibility. Uh, and it is impossible for us to walk on the water, but not impossible for Christ. And so the lesson is Christ can do the impossible for us. That's what the whole point of it is. He might not stop the storm, but he'll still be there in the vicinity to help us. And he's the one that does the impossible, not us. So, you know, we've got some beautiful quotations uh, like Revelation 7 verse 14. It says, these are they which have come out of great tribulation. So for all the saints that are in the kingdom, we're all going to have stories to swap and stories to tell of the things that we went through in order to grasp hold of Christ. And we've got, obviously, that beautiful quotation. You know, as you think about the storm, you think about the boat, you think about the desperation of the disciples and Jesus in the vicinity, this is the whole lesson. I'll never leave you or forsake you. This is the lesson to us. We're going through some time that we might find stressful. Jesus is there in the vicinity. He wants us to lean and to come to him. So, verse 28, what happens? Uh, Peter asked him and said, now, the King James is not real good there. This word if is not in the original. It wasn't a question. Like, Peter wasn't saying, I wonder who this is. Sounds like Jesus. Is it you? No. Um, it's more definitive. Peter answered him and said, Lord, it's you. So bid me to come to you. So there was no hesitation as far as Peter was concerned. Now, we really need to sort of think about this picture. Right. Right. It's not a mill pond. There's not some boat just paddling along. This is a brutal storm that has ripped down from Mount Hermon. There's waves smashing all over the place. The disciples have spent eight hours rowing. They're getting nowhere. And Peter's going to step out of the boat, like staggering. I was almost going to think about putting a little paddle pool here, blow up one, fill up with water, and ask someone to come and walk on water here. I mean, that's in a paddle pool with calm water. <laughs> so, you know, you can amplify that out for Peter. This is an amazing gesture of faith. Like, I can't imagine in the middle of a storm putting my oar down and putting my leg over the side of the boat and thinking, I think I can walk through this storm. Like, this is the great heart that Peter was. This is the passionate heart that Peter wants. He wants to be with Christ. 
He wants to do what Christ does. So very courageous, and he wanted, as we say, to imitate Christ, as we all do, but there are some things that you know, we can't do. Christ can do the impossible. We can't. So there's a lesson here for Peter that he didn't need to do the impossible. That, that's the realm of the operation of Jesus Christ. Uh, Job 9 and verse 8 says, talking about God, he who alone spreads the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. So there's areas that God has in his creative power that things that he can do that we can't do. Well, of course, we know the um, story in verse 30. It says, when he saw the wind and the waves, obviously he lost concentration and, and focus on Christ. So, you know, he got out of the boat in the middle of the storm. And sometimes in ecclesial life, we'll observe brothers and sisters do exactly the same, right? I mean, you know, sometimes ecclesial life gets really, really tough and people just throw their hands up and say, I'm getting out of the boat. <laughs> and it's not the right thing to do. In fact, uh, the record there says the boat began, well, he began to sink. All right, so Peter got out of the boat and he began to sink there in that verse 30. And that word sink in verse 30 is the word catapontizo. And it basically, well, the Greek word is kata, which means down. Pontus is the open sea. Basically, it means, vine says it means to drown. There's only one other occurrence when that Greek word is used. It's in Matthew 18 and verse 6. And it says that someone that offends Christ should have a millstone around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. It's that word drown. So our picture of Peter is not that he's sort of, well, you know what, he's getting his ankles a bit wet or his kneecaps are sort of, or his, you know, he's right up to here and he's taken in water. Right, so the storm is so ferocious that Peter's getting down and he's drowning. He's got his head almost under the water. He's getting desperate. Right, that's, that's, that, that's exactly what was happening here. He's trying to fight his way to the surface. Lord, save me, because there's nothing he can do. He's drowning. Have we ever got to that sort of level in our service to Christ? You know, absolutely out of our depth by the things that are going around, around us. And there's nothing else that we can do apart from saying, Lord, save me, help me. So we're not a lot of different to Peter when we try to do things our own way. You know, we sort of get out the ecclesial boat and we say, well, we prove to people, you know, what sort of faith we've got. So we need to be careful that our natural vision of, or, or perhaps our reflection on what we can accomplish within ourselves is, is not too great. And sometimes, of course, we determine that we'll show other brothers and sisters our faith and our fortitude. Well, as we know, Peter began, you know, this particular walk. Uh, he began, obviously, with strength and determination, but he finished drowning, almost. Now, let's remember, he's a professional fisherman. He knows the sea, he knows how to swim, he knows all these particular aspects, but even he couldn't survive, he's floundering. So in the very area that he thought he was qualified, you know, on the water, no, he was finding that he needed Christ. And maybe that's our, uh, ourselves as well. You know, sometimes there are areas that we get into that we think, you know what, well, I can handle this, and we find ourselves sinking and, and drowning and we're thinking, I need, I need some help. And, of course, for Peter, that's exactly, you know, what he found. He found a face in the storm. Can you imagine Peter going under the water? He looks up and he sees Christ there. And there's a hand there. And he reaches out and he grabs hold of that hand. Supportive, helpful, redeeming. And verse 31, I love this word immediately in verse 31. Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand. This is, this is telling us that Jesus was already there. Right? Jesus didn't have to do a 200-metre dash to where Peter was drowning. He was already there. And as Peter reached out, save me, Jesus is already there. And he catches him. And there's a beautiful word. It, it says he caught his hand or stretched forth his hand, epilambaneo, and it, it means that he grasped hold of him strongly. And you know, I just like to think. I'm under the water. I'm drowning. I stick my hand up and I feel a very, very strong grip that just pulls me up. It's not as though he just tapped Peter and said, you'll be okay, mate. You know, It's like, I will pull you up. Imagine Peter's uh, feelings there. Same word here, lay hold on eternal life. This one about um, Saul, Barnabas took him. 
you know, it's like he embraced him. There was a, a strong emotional connection between Barnabas and Saul as he introduced him back into the Jerusalem Ecclesia. So Christ was already there. So there's a little statement that I, I read once, which, which I thought was quite good. It says, Christ allows us sometimes to sink, but he'll never let us drown unless we want to. Christ sometimes allows us to sink, but he'll never let us drown unless we want to. And sadly, you know, there are people in the truth sometimes just get out the ecclesial boat and they just walk off and do their own thing and we don't see them again. That's particularly sad. But one of the learning curves of Peter was he actually needed to be put into this situation so, again, he could reconnect strongly with Christ. So here's the lesson. The lesson is that Peter actually needed to sink. This was some, a circumstance he had to go through to learn who he was and who Christ was. In order to take the next great step of faith with Jesus, walking on water doesn't necessarily increase our faith, but sinking does. So if you're walking on water, everything's fine. As soon as you start to sink, you're thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. At times, we can appear to have confidence to walk on water. And I think I remember that as a teenager coming out of the waters of baptism, I guess. You know, you come out, you think, right, straight course to the kingdom. It's going to be short, fast, furious, and faithful. You know, we're there, and as teenagers, that's what we think. Oh, it doesn't always go well. At times, we're going to hear the, we can appear to have the confidence to walk on water, but having the courage through utter desperation to reach out for Christ when we're up to our neck and drowning in waves and fighting the fierce wind of extreme personal trials shows a far, far superior faith. So for Peter, it wasn't walking on water. It was actually having to reach out to, to Christ and have faith and trust in Christ that was the main lesson. And that was sort of inspiring, really. And, of course, there was going to come another time when Jesus had to uh, reach out to Peter as well and save him from drowning drowning in his own tears All right. the time would come when jesus was unable to physically extend a hand to rescue this disciple he loved but in the midst of his terrible personal storm this is peter when he denied christ he would save him by a compassionate look remember that transformation remember peter looked at him and his whole world moved around and he set a different course in life so for Peter, what an amazing journey. And the important thing is, Jesus took him back to the boat. Verse 32, uh, the wind ceased, uh, the storm abated, and Peter walked back to the boat with Christ. Have a think about that. What, what sort of conversation would have gone on? I mean, obviously, they were sort of reasonably close to the boat, but can you imagine? I mean, Peter walked on water twice, really. Imagine walking back to the boat with Jesus. And Jesus is saying, look, the ecclesial boat is really important. Peter, you can't just get out and do individual stuff. It's impressive. It's amazing. But the reality is you've got to work as a team. And he takes him back to the ecclesial boat. A record in John 6 says, they willingly received him into the ship and immediately it was at the land whither they went. So the lesson that Christ is imparting to Peter was it's not about demonstrating personal faith and courage above and beyond everybody else. It's a cooperation in the boat together to reach the destination. And that's what happened in this particular story. And I always like this little phrase, you can't rock the boat if you're busy rowing. Okay, so if we're all down and we're rowing in synchronised fashion, we get somewhere. As soon as you get half the boat, throw their paddles out, well, we just go around in circles or, you know, standing up, uh, making a protest, it, it just doesn't work. So, you know, that, that technique was particularly important. Now, we're not going to go here, but 12 months later, there was another storm. Uh, and it's in the book of Acts. It's The disciples are now on their own, and the Sanhedrin of the Pharisees are determined to sink the ecclesial boat. And there's going to be a storm that's going to be happening. The record in Acts 4 and verse 5, don't need to go there, but it says, the rulers and the elders and the scribes, Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexandra, the kindred of the high priest, gathered together and they were going to suppress the ecclesia. They were going to drown it. And these men had learnt the lesson on the Lake of Galilee of prayer, perseverance and participation. Here, here's the quotes here. They lifted up their voice, they're praying. Behold their threats, we're not going to back off. Grant unto thy servants boldness, they're going to persevere. And then, of course, 
participate the multitude of them but believe with one heart and one soul. So the lesson the disciples learned on the Lake of Galilee was transposed into the book of Acts when they faced a storm. And of course the lesson is the same for us today. You know, there may be storms that we go through ecclesially or personally. We've got to work together as a team with our brothers and sisters. And you know what? One day we're going to walk on water. One day we're going to walk on water. It's in the book of Revelation. It promises us that. So, of course, it'll be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it says, I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on a sea of glass. I guess it's metaphorical. In, in, I mean, we're not, I mean, we'll be immortal. We can do anything, I guess. But in reality, we'll be standing on a world that is peaceful and secure and we'll be a part of that process. And sort of Peter will be there as well. So that's, you know, a wonderful little scenario of where we're going to in the future. So what have we learned tonight? Peter was humble enough to recognise his personal deficiencies. Do we accept the incredible blessing of our calling? Like Peter, Lord, I'm just a fisherman. I'm just a humble fisherman. And you called me to be an apostle. I don't know whether I can do it. And Christ encouraged him to make that, that decision. He was prepared to leave his occupation and, make, and following Christ his first priority. First priority. Everything else was you know, second, third, fourth on the list. Are we occupied with everyday issues? You know, Are we overwhelmed? I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Peter was a man of action and demonstrated this in attempting to imitate Christ on the water. How courageous were we? You know, what an amazing thing. We're not deprecating Peter. What an amazing thing to put a foot over the boat and then to get out and walk through the storm. Amazing. Where do we, you know, do we have that level of passion and commitment to Christ? Christ taught him the value of cooperation in the ecclesial boat. Are we a team player or are we more focused on doing our own thing? It's important for us. And when we're sinking, do we have the courage to reach out for help? It might not be with Christ. I mean, obviously, he's in the vicinity and the angels are providentially working in our lives. But maybe it might be another brother or another sister. We've got to put our hand up and say, I need help. I'm sinking a little bit. These are the great lessons of the Apostle Peter, the snapshots that we have, confession and courage. What a wonderful disciple he is as he followed the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to have a look at uh, Peter again, and uh, we're in the last 12 months now. You know, the transition seems to happen very quickly with Peter. We only get sort of snapshots of where he is and what he's doing. And we're going to see now a sort of a dimension of a spiritual maturity that he has. We've seen his confidence and his passion, his love for Christ, and we're now going to have that reaffirmed. And there's a spiritual dimension now that we're going to see come out from Peter. You know, often we look at these disciples and we think, well, they're fumbling along. They don't know what's going on. But actually, Peter is very perceptive and he listens. I mean, John chapter 6 is a, a large discourse and many of the people just walked away. We're going to see the, the wonderful depths that Peter has. You know, last night we, he was busy fixing nets while Christ was talking to everyone else. In this scenario, he's listened very closely to what the Lord has said while other people are wandering away. So it's almost the reverse of what we had a look uh, at last night. So we'll come, to, come back to verse 22. Verse 22 gives us a bit of a chronology of where we are. You know, Peter's still, well, he's still drying out from uh, his walk on the water where he almost drowned. He's still drying out because verse 22, and if you look at the narrative just before that, this is the scenario we looked at last night, Peter walking on the water and, and Christ... Uh, rescuing him and taking him back to the boat. Verse 22, there's a, there's a particular important phrase, says the day following. All right, so Peter's barely dried out from his drowning experience on the Sea of Galilee. And as Christ reached down to him and provided salvation and encouragement to Peter, you know what Peter's going to do? He's going to do that for the Lord. He's going to reach out to the hand of the Lord and provide some astounding and encouraging statements. 
So again, this is what fellowship is all about, isn't it? This is what being brothers and sisters is all about. Sometimes, you know, we're on the top of the mountain and we can lift people up with us. Other times we're in the valley and we need to be lifted up ourselves. So this is what fellowship is all about. So we're up to this uh, little second snapshot and we're going to have a look at a couple of scenarios. Uh, we're going to see his, his confidence on the mountain as well. His affirmative support now of Jesus Christ. He's not reticent. He's not busy with his fishing. He's now going to dedicate his life, first priority, to following Christ. And we know this particular discourse where the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he shuts down the smorgasbord, we might say. People are coming to him because, well, you know, there's bread and there's miracles happening. Jesus is going to shut that all down now, and he's going to filter out the disciples who are actually following him, not just simply for the miracles and the bread, but for people who are looking for the bread of life. And that's the statement of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we think about Christ, I mean, he could have created a mega church, we might say. There were 5,000 people following him. And if he was after popularity, then he could have continued, you know, with that popularity. And again, there are a lot of churches in today's world uh, where they preach this gospel of prosperity. And they say, you know, come to Jesus as you are. Jesus will bless you. You know, you'll have abundance of this world. And it's sort of this gospel of prosperity and people flock to hear it because they love to hear that, well, life's going to get better for them. It's almost the reverse here. Jesus had a great following, but he actually dissipates them and he says, life's going to get tough. If you want to follow me, it's more than just bread and miracles. It's a hard slog. And we're actually going to see Peter, he confirms that uh, particular statement. So verse 26 of John 6, uh, Jesus closed down the buffet. He says, Verily I say unto you, you seek me, uh, not because you saw the miracles, but because you ate the loaves and you were filled. So it's all about food. It's all about the benefit they were getting. And again, in verse 35, Jesus now transfers that. And he says, well, I am the bread of life. You know, the teachings and the ministry that I distill is the feature that you should be after, not just bread to put in your mouth. And the result of that, of course, when we come across to verse 66, and this is where we want to pick up the narrative and we want to pick up uh, Peter's affirmative statement. When we come across to verse 66, it says, From that time, many, many, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So you know how sometimes we, we've, we've heard or we have that preconception that Peter was just impulsive and he was random, he just did things on, on the cuff. This is where we see Peter in his solidarity with Christ because lots of disciples were just walking away, but Peter wasn't. He was not impulsive. He had a passion for Christ. He was a true disciple. And as we say, he's now going to provide for Christ words of great encouragement. So notice there in verse 60 as well, uh, this, this is repeated. Verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when he heard this discourse, says, well, this is a hard saying. Again, we've looked at verse 60, 66. And what's interesting here is you'll notice there's a comment about betrayal. Uh, between all these disciples that are walking away, Jesus is not unaffected with that. And significantly, again, in verse 64, he makes a comment. Jesus knew from the beginning who it was that believed not and who would betray him. So there's going to be a contrast now to disciples walking away. And Judas, in that sense, is sort of linked with them in contrast to Peter, who reaffirms his faithfulness. And again, at the end of verse 71, uh, he spoke of Judas Iscariot. We think, well, why, why would this be in the narrative? Uh, because Jesus was very sensitive to people who didn't listen, people who were walking away. Hence, the encouragement that Peter gave him was quite substantial. What a, what a wonderful and loyal disciple. So we, we back up to verse 60. People were saying, well, you know, this is a hard saying. Well, and when we read John chapter 6, I know we didn't read it this morning because it is quite convoluted, it's quite involved. Uh, it certainly is a, a very heavy discourse. But people weren't saying, well, you know, I, I just didn't understand that. They were basically saying, I don't want to follow this pathway. It's going to be too hard for me. I'm happy with the miracles. I'm happy with the bread. But following Jesus on the pathway, it's too hard. And so people started to, to walk away. So from boatloads of people the day before, 5,000, 5,000, it's dwindling down to 12 almost. There were just a few people that were, were standing by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And this particular translation is quite interesting there uh, on verse 66. It says, Jesus' speech made many of his disciples go back to the lives they led before they followed Jesus. All right, so there's a complete reversal. Jesus is calling us to a different life. It's not a life of selfishness or all about me. It's a life of following Christ and sharing with our brothers and sisters our experiences and encouraging them. So with these disciples, they just reverse back to the lives they had before. And that's a particularly sad comment. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is not unaffected. And you'll notice there in verse 67, he asked this uh, very poignant question, really. He says to his men, what are you guys going to do? You're going to go away too? So we need to think about the Lord Jesus Christ just for a little bit. You know, we tend to imagine that the Lord perhaps was quite robotic because, you know, he knew where he had to go. He knew there was the crucifixion. There was the pathway and away he went. Let's just wind back a little bit and think how Jesus felt when 5,000 people basically walked away from him. He said, too hard. And there's just a group of 12 men standing around him. He says, you guys, are you going to stick with me? Or are you going to go away as well? And you can imagine Judas sort of looking across at Thomas. You know, Thomas, uh, we, we say he was the doubter. Jesus looking across at him thinking, yeah, you know, maybe we need to rethink this. And while that question is being asked and the disciples all look at each other for sort of to, to gauge what they were going to do, there's one voice that comes out amongst all those disciples. And it's Peter in verse 68. And he says, Lord, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. What a fantastic statement. Where those disciples sort of thinking, well, we just saw 5,000 people disappear. We thought this rabbi was the great teacher and the kingdom's going to be here. And everyone's walking away. What are we going to do? Peter pulls them all together with an astounding statement. Where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now, here's the point. Peter's barely dried out from the day before. He was drowning. He's, you know, obviously he's dried out, but I'm just sort of exaggerating a little bit. You know, he's still sort of wet, I guess, from the experiences 24 hours before. He immediately springs to his feet and demonstrates his passion for Christ. On this occasion, and I just think this is a really lovely uh, gesture, it's his hand that's reaching out to encourage Christ. His focus is where it should be. Jesus has the words. So you see, Peter has very perceptively picked up the essence of the discourse of John chapter 6. He's, these men are not just ignorant fishermen who had no education. They were perceptive to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll see this in the way that Christ has this discourse and he talks about the bread of life. And I've got this coloured in, in John chapter 6. What he's saying is it's not just about literal bread. He's saying the teachings and the ministry will impart to you life, life eternal. And Peter picks that up. You have the words, the bread of eternal life. Peter got the point of John chapter 6. 5,000 people didn't get it. And they all walked away. Peter steps forward. He brings the disciples together with him. And he says, where are we going to go? You've actually got the teachings about life. So a very, uh, a very powerful uh, interpretation of this particular statement. So let's wind back a little bit. Peter wasn't just an impulsive person. He just didn't jump out and say, Lord, you know, I see all these people going away, but we'll stick with you. Don't know why. We don't know where we're going. We're quite ignorant of all this. No, no. He has picked up the teachings of Christ and grounded himself in that, and he's going to walk alongside the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is not an impulsive man, and that's a, a very profound note of encouragement to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's three phrases here that I want to sort of highlight because they're particularly important when we break them up. So the first one, and again, I've got them coloured in. Good to colour them in in your Bible. I've got fluoro green at the end of verse 68 and 69 because I want those words to jump out at me. I know John 6 is a long chapter, but at the end of it, Peter steps forward and he says three things. Who will we follow? Where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
and we believe and know you are the Holy One of God. So there's three important phrases. I'm going to break them up to show uh, the depth of Peter's understanding. So where are we going to go? Well, we know sort of Ruth in a conversation with Naomi uh, connected herself to Naomi and she says the same thing. You know, where you go, I'm going to go. So when we sort of think about the narrative and the story of Ruth and Naomi, it's an astounding faith. And that's transferred across to Peter and Christ as well. Second Samuel 15, 21, it's Hai the Giddite. Remember, uh, David was moving out into the wilderness. Absalom had come into Jerusalem. David was distressed. His whole household was moving out in the wilderness. They didn't know what was going to happen. And Itai the Giddite came alongside David and David said, look, you don't have to come with me. I know you've just joined uh, the, the um, soldiers just recently. And Itai says the same thing. He says, where you go, David, I want to go as well. And of course, beautifully in Psalm 73, 25. Uh, that's a good reference, honestly, to put in against verse uh, 68 and 69. Whom have I in heaven but thee? There's none on earth that I desire beside thee. This is Peter's statement of faith. Astounding, wonderful. Imagine how our Lord Jesus Christ felt. You have the words of eternal life. And again, he's picked up the statements of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't about the miracles. It wasn't about the bread. It was about the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, uh, the words of life picked up by Paul in Philippians 2 and also by the Apostle John in 1st of John chapter 1. The words of eternal life. So I guess we've got to ask the question for ourselves, why are we following Jesus? Like, Why are we here this weekend? You know, is it something that we're going to get in this present life that we're after? Or is it because we know there's a greater vision and a better life beyond in the kingdom? And certainly when we look at the world in disarray, you know, this word uncertainty and unprecedented is just surfacing all the time. And we are so blessed that we know that there's a better future coming for us. Now, here's a statement that is really, really powerful. When you think of a Jew, they were very fastidious about believing that there is one God and only one God. So when Jesus said, well, I'm the son of God, they couldn't digest that. They couldn't comprehend that. But Peter makes this amazing jump beyond any definition by a Pharisee, a Sadducee or a Sanhedrin. And he says, we know that you are the son of God. Now, that's a massive digestation of an amazing principle. No rabbi would accept that statement. They wouldn't accept it back in the days of Peter. They wouldn't even accept it now because they don't believe the Messiah has come. But Peter makes this massive leap of faith. And he says, I believe you're the Holy One of God. John 11, remember, Martha says that to the Lord Jesus Christ on the backdrop of the death of Lazarus. She was very, very distressed. Jesus comes into that whole environment and it's Martha who makes this amazing statement of faith. I believe that you are the Son of God and you, you could resurrect Lazarus if you wanted to. Uh, and again, John chapter 20, as John concludes his gospel, and again, John, the apostle in his epistle. So, you know, we've got to appreciate uh, this powerful element in the statement of Peter. It's not a statement that's given in ignorance or uh, misunderstanding. It's a statement that really confirmed for Christ who he was. Can you imagine how Jesus would have felt? You know, just quite a, an astounding thing. And for ourselves, when we go through times of trauma and difficulty, I know there are brothers and sisters that have had Significant things happen in their life. Great losses. And these two verses are the verses they come back to because despite all the trauma that's going on in their life or has gone in their life, they don't walk away from God. They don't walk away from Christ because where are we going to go? Where are we going to go, brothers and sisters? So the other thing that's really interesting is that Peter's statement isn't just impulsive and it's not exclusive. He doesn't just talk about himself. He doesn't push aside his disciples and say, well, I don't know where these guys are going, but I'm going to follow you. Did you see the word we? It's worth circling in verse 68. Where shall we go? Verse 69, and we believe. So Peter is very inclusive. What he's done is he's put his arms around all the disciples and grouped them together 
and said, we're going to follow you, Lord. So for some disciples, like, well, Judas maybe and Thomas, who were sort of on the fringe there, suddenly they're included in the embrace of Peter. He says, we as a group, we're not going anywhere, Lord. And so he, he, he brought them uh, together. So the 12 remained quite solid because Peter, at a critical moment, had that rock-solid faith uh, that was able to sustain both himself and the Lord and bring together those disciples in a moment of loneliness for Christ. Think about the loneliness of Jesus. We know how sensitive Christ was when, you know, he saw people with a handicap or a disadvantage. He couldn't help himself but reach out and touch them because he was a man of great compassion. Imagine how he felt when 5,000 people walked away and said, this is too hard, this is rubbish. If he's not going to feed us with bread, we don't want to be here. Imagine how Jesus felt. And Peter steps into that gap. So for ourselves, I guess we've got to rewind a little bit and think, well, where do we sit in our commitment for Christ? When times get tough, what's our statement of faith? When we see brothers and sisters with their faith wavering, do we have second thoughts and doubts about ourselves? Or do we group our brothers and sisters together and say, come on, we know that the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is just around the corner. Let's remain faithful. So for Peter, this was quite uh, an amazing moment. And as we said, uh, in the narrative there, we have inbuilt that statement of the 12, the group together. So Peter was able to, to group them together and they followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to come across to Matthew chapter 16 for our next little scenario. Uh, this is the transfiguration. So we're now going to jump six months. So we're now six months before the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, Christ would have been aware of that pressure. Uh, it was only six months away. And so he too needed encouragement. So Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 17 as well is this particular uh, incident. Matthew 16 and verse 13, we've got a sort of a geographic location. It says he comes into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. Well, that word coast really <laughs> reminds us of the beach, but it's not the beach. It's actually the border, and it's not Caesarea on the coast. It's Caesarea Philippi. Uh, so this is just north of Galilee. So here's a picture of this particular area, <clears throat> and it is a very fertile area. Uh, if you've been to Israel, it's, it's a very... Uh, Beautiful area with, with lots of water. It's right at the foot of Mount Hermon. And uh, Jesus is up there because he needs to position himself because of the pressure the furthest away from the city of Jerusalem. So he's headed right out north to the area of Dan. Remember in the Old Testament, uh, Dan and Beersheba were the two extents of the land. Well, Jesus is feeling that pressure. And so now he's removed himself geographically right out to Dan. Uh, it's an interesting place because there was a lot of false worship set up in this area. And that's the environment in which, again, Christ is going to ask Peter, well, what do you think about me? And so with all this swirl of uh, religious uh, differences, this is where Peter again reconfirms his faith. So here it is. It's called the Grotto of Pan. There's a bit of a cave there. And it was a place of worship. There's uh, springs in there that previously they used to throw human sacrifices in, and the bodies would disappear into the grotto in an underground stream. So it's quite a, quite a strange place. If you go there, you can see all these little indentations in the rock, and that's where they've sort of etched them out, and they used to put little sacrifices there to their gods. So this is exactly where Jesus is with his men. And, of course, uh, just about 20 years before uh, the birth of Christ, there was built these temples, Herod the Great built this uh, amazing marble temple uh, and Philip, his son, built the city that was called Caesarea Philippi. So when we're thinking about this, it's a place of confusion, we might say. Lots of different religions were all in this area, uh, Jewish religion, Greek, Roman, of course. So there was all this swirling around in this particular area. But we want to come to this particular point uh, in verse 13, where Jesus now is going to be building his disciples. He's got six months to go, and he wants to confirm the faith of Peter 
and his men. So you'll notice here, there's a series in verse 13, 20, 21, 24, Jesus is really focusing on his disciples. He needs to build them up. He needs to build their confidence. So he repeated four times. Now, there's a bit of a, a play in verse 13 on this word men. He asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, are? Uh, uh. So this is a, a sort of interesting title. Who, who do men say that I, the son of man, are? Uh. And what's interesting about this title, the son of man, is it's used exclusively by the Lord Jesus Christ. 85 times in the gospel records, Jesus used this title of himself. The son of man. Well, people were confused who Jesus was. So he's now wanting the disciples to define their understanding of Christ. Maybe we need to do that ourselves. Who do we think Christ really is? Uh, there were people who said, well, he's the Lamb of God. Someone called him a rabbi. Philip said, we found the Messiah. Nathaniel called him the Son of God. Jesus used this title, the Son of Man. So why? The Son of Man. Well, you'll notice it again. In verse 27, the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with the angels. You'll notice again in verse 28. You'll notice it again in chapter 17, verse 9 and 12 and 22. Because this title is not a title that connects himself to humanity, which we might think it is. Oh, he's connecting himself to man. It's actually a title of authority and judgment. And whenever you look this particular title up, you'll find that. You might remember at the end of Acts chapter 7, Stephen in his final moments says, I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of the Father. It was a title of authority and judgment. And that's where Jesus uh, used that. So, well, you know, he's asking what people thought about Christ. And there's a whole list uh, through the gospel of people who sort of, this was their identity as far as Christ was concerned. You know, some say he's John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah. So there's all these different shades of opinion. Peter's going to make a titanic statement of faith as to who he believed Jesus was. And so uh, Jesus narrows it uh, in verse 15. So he says, what are people saying about me? So, you know, prophet, a great prophet, Jeremiah maybe. He narrows it in verse 15. And he looks at the disciples and says, what about you? What's your definition of me? And Peter leaps out with an astonishing response. Look at verse uh, 16 there. It's Peter who says, amazing statement, a dogmatic assertion as to his belief. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. No rabbi no teacher, no Jew in the entire nation would ever have that definition of Christ. Peter steps out and he says, I believe you're the son of the living God. That's an amazing definition. And you see what Peter's done here? He's joined the promises together. He understands. Second of Peter understands Second of Samuel chapter 7. I will be his father. He will, he will be my son. So there's, there's no ignorant fisherman here. He understood the Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah 7 and verse 14, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, Emmanuel. Peter understood that and he linked the son with the father. So Peter's statement was entirely, we might say, un-Jewish. And as we said, there wasn't uh, a Jew in the land, uh, particularly amongst the Sanhedrin and all the highly educated uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, who would ever have that definition? So really, we might even say Peter understood more than the high priest Caiaphas at that time. So in verse 17, Jesus says, well, flesh and blood hasn't revealed that to you. Now, this is what does that mean? You know, what, I mean, we, we read over this, oh, that's interesting, flesh and blood. What Jesus is saying is, Peter, I understand that's not a natural observation that's a spiritual dimension and understanding. So these fishermen were not just simply, you know, shuffling along behind Jesus Christ, wondering where it was all going. 
Peter already has a definitive statement that he's linked through to the Old Testament and he understands Jesus is the son of the living God. And that's a spiritual dimension, says Christ, and he commends him for that. I wonder, you know, what sort of definition we have for the Lord Jesus Christ in our own life. Do we truly believe that he's the son of the living God and he's going to return now? I say that because I can remember sitting in the lounge of a brother who was dying and he had bowel cancer and he's on, he's on, a, he's on a bed in his lounge. He's got, I don't know, days and weeks to go. And I can remember him saying to me, Steve, you know what? They've offered me a number of operations. But he said, I've had enough and I fully believe in the resurrection and that I'll awake after I die in the presence of Jesus Christ. And I can remember sitting there thinking, that is amazing faith. I mean, we all sit here and we all say, oh, yeah, I'm sure I'll do that, but I wonder whether we would. So people make and they come to this point of realisation where they define Christ as being the son of the living God. And, of course, this particular statement by Peter became a recognised statement in the Sanhedrin. And they wanted to take hold of Peter because he made that statement in his uh, Caiaphas' uh, comment in Matthew 26. He has Christ before him and there's a tribunal there and he says, I adjure thee by the living God that you tell us whether you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He uses exactly the same phrase as Peter. So Peter's going to come under a bit of pressure because if Peter could defect, he was the one who made that statement as well. So here's this little comment uh, from Christ and there's a sort of a, a quite an interesting interaction in the narrative. Uh, who do men say, my father in heaven? Simon Peter, Simon Bar-Jonah, the son of the living God, the son of man. Now, what's interesting in, in this particular aspect is, you know, the Roman Catholic Church interprets this particular verse as, well, Peter's the rock. But that's not what Jesus is saying. The statement of Peter is the rock, all right? And we get that here. He says, you're Peter, and upon this rock-solid statement of faith, I'll build, well, he says, my ecclesia. I say Peter's ecclesia. It's my ecclesia. And it's this statement here that is the rock. It's the statement, of course, of Peter himself. And Peter picked up on that, and he said, well, that's the foundation that we build upon. He didn't uh, take the accolades of glory to himself and say, well, look what Christ said about me. I'm the foundation. Never ever said that because this is what he writes in his epistle. He's a living stone and we've got to be built on that foundation. And again, Paul says exactly the same. The foundation, the rock solid statement of Christ. He's the chief cornerstone and we're all built together. So again, both Peter and the apostle Paul uh, totally understood that. Well, Peter's faith was foundational, as in verse 21, uh, it's now going to be tested. Notice this statement. Peter's come out with this astounding statement. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now look at verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples he's going to suffer. Elders, chief priests, scribes, and be killed and raised on the third day. So here comes the test for Peter. And I do like this statement by Brother Norris. He says this, Peter's faith is being built. It needed a faith which Peter was not yet able to muster. He's got an astounding statement of faith. That's going to be tested. To see beyond the cold body of a dead king to the same king raised in glory. And that's why Jesus introduces in verse 21 this whole narrative about, well, I'm going to be crucified and killed. Where would be the evidence of your faith then? And so they're walking along, of course, the disciples uh, are walking behind the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll notice verse 22. Peter grabbed hold of the Lord and began to rebuke him and say, this isn't happening to you. Uh, that word took him is, is the Greek word proslambano. And it means to take to oneself. It means to physically embrace and take to oneself. So it wasn't just, you know, a conversation on the back of the disciples. Peter literally, because he loved his Lord, when Christ says, well, I'm going to be crucified and killed. He grabbed hold of the Lord and said, you're not, you're not going to Jerusalem. You're not going there. This, 
is not where you need to go. Uh, the um, New Revised Standard Version says, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. Diaglot puts a double negative. Not, not shall this be to you. In fact, if you've got the King James, you'll have a marginal rendition. And you'll notice it says, pity yourself. Pity yourself. Yeah. Now, that Greek word, helios, is only used on one other occasion, Hebrews 8 and verse 12, and it's rendered merciful. So what Peter is saying to Christ is, take it easy, Lord. You don't have to do this. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to go on this pathway. And you can imagine from the perspective of the Lord, that would be very tempting. It's not going to be an easy pathway at all. I mean, when you, when you read all about this, he's going to suffer many things. He's going to be killed. And, and the Lord knew from prophecies what that would involve. That would have been very tempting to the Lord Jesus Christ just to back off a bit, to be merciful, to pity himself, to think about himself. But you know what's interesting? Verse 22, and I, I've got this word circled in my Bible. It's the word began. Peter took him and began to rebuke. Peter didn't finish it because the Lord interrupted him. Peter took him and began to rebuke him. In mid-sentence, the Lord interrupted him. He said, that's enough, Peter. We're not going down that pathway. I mean, that's the way to deal with sin, isn't it? If we had that courage, it's like to cut it off. I'm not, going to go, I'm not going to have that thought. No, I'm refocusing. Most of us don't sort of have that stamina. We sort of dabble around and we often go down a particular pathway. We're distracted. Jesus, as soon as Peter was started to make that statement, cut him off mid-sentence. And in fact, we know that very uh, strong comment the Lord Jesus Christ made in verse 23. He turned, so Peter was behind him, and said, get behind me. Well, it doesn't make a lot of, st <laughs> you know, when someone already is sort of behind you, uh, you're turning around and say, get behind me. That could be very confusing. But of course, you know, Jesus, of course, is facing Peter now and saying, this is the wrong direction we're going in. And then look at what the Lord says. You're an offence to me. I find it quite staggering that on the other side of the page, Jesus is commending Peter and saying, "Flesh and you've got a great spiritual dimension, Peter. You understand who I am. That's wonderful. And a few verses later, he's saying to Peter, you're an offence to me. Like what a robust relationship these two men had. And again, when we're very close to people, we can be robust in our conversation. I don't know if you had brothers and sisters when you were growing up, but you know, there were some very robust conversations. Often it became physical. <laughs> and so, you know, the more robust the conversation, the closer you are to another person. Again, in our, our marital uh, dimension as well, we can have strong conversations. And, and they're transforming conversations. You know, sometimes I've been wrong and only Beth's been right. You know, that's an education process for me. It's what marriage is all about. But this is the beautiful part about the relationship between Peter and Christ. Christ should say, that's wrong, Peter, and that's offensive. I'm going to cut you off right there, and Peter can take that on board. And the Lord uses quite uh, an interesting word. It's the Greek word scandalon. actually means a trap. This word means a trap. And here it's used in Romans 14 as well in how we operate with our brothers and sisters and other young people. Uh, let us not therefore judge one another, but judge this. Don't trap another person or put an occasion for... Don't say to another young person, take it easy. You know, I, the truth's not for you, take it easy. You know, do your own thing. No, no, that's not good advice. That's not good advice at all. Uh, that's a trap. We've got to make sure that we are more like Peter in the first instance, encouraging each other on, on a faithful course and are leaning against the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, of course... Christ says, get behind me. Strong body language here uh, by the Lord. And we know that when we want to express ourselves in a very solid way, then we use body language. And Jesus did that. He just didn't sort of, you know, say, oh, Peter, that's enough of that. He actually turned around and he rebuked Peter strongly. And one translation says, get out of my way, Satan. You are a danger to me because your mind is not on the things of God, but the things of man. Amazing, robust relationship between Peter and Christ. And you know what Christ is doing? In your margin, uh, you want to put where, where he rebukes Peter. 
uh, in verse 23. You want to put Luke 4 and verse 8. Get behind me, Satan. That's exactly the same phrase that Jesus said to the tempter in the wilderness. Remember, right at the beginning of Christ's uh, exit from the baptismal waters into the wilderness, the tempter came and said, you can do this and this and this. And he said, get behind me, Satan. Cut off that thought. And here it is being repeated again to Peter. So we have to be careful about the advice we give to brothers and sisters when we say, take it easy, because that's exactly what Peter was saying to Christ. And so there's, uh, again, quite a strong contrast. And again, this, uh, uh, you know, just amazing here in verse 17 that he can say, blessed are you, but here in verse 23, he says you're an offence. It's just highlighting not the distance between Jesus and Peter, but their unity and the robustness of the relationship they had together. You know, if you're close to a person, you can say some tough things, and we need to. Sometimes we need to, you know, they call it tough love. Because we love another person, we don't let them go down a particular pathway of self-destruction. We come and we say, hey, it's not, that's not the right way, because we love them. And this is Peter here, this is Christ, and they're having this discourse together. So Peter understood that, and Jesus said, get behind me, Peter. You're not taking the lead. You need to follow me. And a bit later on, we've got those beautiful words, First to Peter 2, where Peter learnt the lesson, and he recollects that. And he says, this is why we're called. Christ suffered for us. He went on that pathway of suffering, leaving this example, not that we should take a different pathway, but that we need to follow in his footsteps. So, you know, it's, a, it's a, a deep cut as far as Peter's concerned, but a lesson learnt and good advice passing to us. So we come to chapter 17 where there's a transfiguration now, and this is interesting as well. You'll notice here in chapter 17 and verse 1, Jesus needed this transfiguration because he's only six months from the crucifixion. And he needed encouragement by men of substance. And it's going to be an appearance by Moses and Elijah to come alongside Christ and to tell him that that pathway, that exodus, is the right pathway. So Jesus needed that right after this discourse. So you'll notice there in verse 1, it says after six days, and I just love this point here, takes Peter. Do you see that in verse 1? After six days, Jesus takes Peter. I just like it how Peter heads the list because there was not a disconnection in the conversation that, you know, sometimes we have a really rough conversation with people and it's like no talkies for a week or a month, or a year or maybe longer, you know, because we've had this sort of hard argument with someone, you know, we're not going to talk to them. Well, that's not how Christ and Peter responded. And so it's just six days later and there's Peter, James and John. Jesus is going to take these great men with him into this amazing moment. So, you know, there's encouragement on the side of the Lord for Peter as out of the group of 12, he takes these three special men who are going to be, have great responsibility later on to, to see this moment. So, of course, you know, I guess we know the story well. Uh, it talks about in verse 2, Jesus was transfigured. Uh, his raiment was as white as the sun. <coughs> so the gospel records uh, talk about uh, this in amazing terms. Mark says radiant, intensely white. Luke says glistering. So there's the essence of a divine countenance there. And, of course, you might recall <clears throat> when Moses came down from the mountain, his face shone. But here it was Christ's whole body shone. So it's actually showing the difference. What Christ was on the inside now was radiating on the outside as well. So... This word in verse 2, the word transfigured, is the word metamorpho, a metamorphosis. What Jesus was on the inside now was physically revealed on the outside as well. And um, it's that word, you know, change or transfigured. In fact, Paul used it, you might want to jot this in your margin, that word transfigured. Paul used it in Romans 12 and verse 2, where he says, Don't be conformed to this world. But be transfigured, I think is the word in the King James is transformed, by the renewing of your mind to prove that which is good and acceptable. So <clears throat> what we are on the inside has to be seen on the outside as well. 
Well, of course, uh, we know that the story, uh, the two disciples, well, the disciples there were just quite amazed. And again, it's Peter, isn't it, in verse 4, who actually makes a few comments. And it's Peter who says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Uh, things were pretty bleak. You know, a week ago, a little bit over a week ago, there, there were people and disciples following us. You know, at one time we had 5,000 people. Uh, it's good that we're here and I, and I see this amazing uh, circumstance. This is what we've been looking for. This is where we want to go, to see you in glory and might and power. This is what we want. And so he says in verse 4, let's make three tabernacles for you here. Well, you know, what does Peter mean by that statement? Why did he say that particular statement? And I'll tell you why. It was because of the Feast of Tabernacles was happening. It was right then and there. John 7 verse 2 says that chronologically in the Jewish calendar, where six months before, of course, the crucifixion of Christ, it actually was the Feast of Tabernacles or booths, that we might say. And what did that uh, commemorate? The Feast of Booths was the exodus of Israel out of Egypt. So here's Peter and he's putting it together. And he's thinking, this is the moment. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. It's all about the exodus, all about deliverance. Jesus is our king. It's all happening. And, of course, he, put, he says the timing is just amazing. It's all working out. This is the first phase of the exodus, the release of the people of Israel into prosperity. And, of course, Peter's mind would have been going to Zechariah 14, wouldn't it? That it will come to pass that all the nations will come up and they will celebrate what? The Feast of Tabernacles. That's Zechariah 14. So this is Peter's mind. Let's make three tabernacles. This is great. This is the beginning of the kingdom. That's what Peter was thinking. Well, of course, verse 5 talks about a cloud descending and uh, a voice that gave direction to not three tabernacles or three people, but the Son of God to listen to him. So this really, uh, when we look at this whole scenario, it does actually parallel uh, the context of the kingdom. So, for example, in verse 28, uh, he talks about there'll be some who are alive and they'll see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Uh, in verse 1, they depart, of course. There's an exclusive group. And that was the, the three disciples. Christ is revealed in his glory. Uh, he's compassionate in his judgment. Uh, we see that in verse 6 and 7, Jesus you know, the disciples were afraid. Jesus touched them. He embraced them. He said, be of good comfort. Be of good cheer. Elijah's going to restore all things. That's the conversation in verse 11. Jesus answers that Elijah will come and restore all things. Uh, he begins the process of Israel being cured. They're saved out of the fire. There's a little incident that happens in verse 15 through to 18. Talks about my son's always falling into the fire. Uh, in verse 20, he talks about, say to this mountain, be removed. And finally, in verse 20 as well, uh, it talks about a grain of mustard seed that will fill the whole world. So it's interesting just in this chapter, you can actually build a picture of the kingdom, really. The, the parallels are there. Well, this particular incident had a, a massive impact on Peter. You know, when you were, if you were Peter, when you'd be writing about Christ, you'd be thinking, the substantial thing that convinced me that Jesus was truly the Son of God was the resurrection. You'd be thinking that, right? Well, Peter doesn't use it that way at all. He talks about uh, the transfiguration was the convincing point for him. So he, he writes this a little bit later on. So uh, when he's writing his epistle, he uses this word tabernacle as well. He now understands that a tabernacle is just something that's very temporary. As long as I'm in this tabernacle, it's unusual that he says it that way. But he recognises that the kingdom is not here and now. And he's going to put off his tabernacle. He's going to die. Uh, he originally wanted to build a tabernacle, but a more mature Peter understands the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. And it's, he sees it in a better way. But here, of course, uh, in 2 Peter 1, he writes about this incident as being convincing to him that Jesus is the Christ, not the resurrection, which is quite astounding. And the terms he uses are very interesting. Uh, he says that you might be able to, after my decease, in the Greek words, the word exodus. 
So that, that sort of, he's referencing back to the transfiguration. He says, we were eyewitnesses. This was no dream. This was no vision. We were eyewitnesses of the majesty of Jesus Christ. And he saw it in a more fuller extent there at the transfiguration than he did at the resurrection. Jesus revealed in all his glory. And again, um, <clears throat> he received from God the Father honour and glory. This is the transfiguration. Uh, again, he uses the terminology of the garments of the high priest. I saw Jesus. He was transfigured. He was radiant. He had garments of honour and glory. There's a reference, of course, of course, to the high priest. In fact, he says, uh, the excellent glory. He superseded both Moses and Elijah. And here in Hebrews, of course, Paul uses that terminology, a more excellent uh, ministry. And then finally, this is the voice which we heard, and he relates that back to Deuteronomy 18. That's the prophecy of the greater prophet, prophet not Moses, but Jesus Christ. So you can see how wonderfully Peter takes that moment that for him was a confirmation of who Christ really was. You know, it added that greater dimension to you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he now saw Christ in radiant glory. And he said, that's it for me. I'm not going to look back. I'm going to follow Christ. So this is the beautiful aspect of Peter in this incident. So what have we learned this morning? We've learned, again, the consolidation, the robustness and the relationship that Peter had with Christ. Quite amazing. And how at times Jesus needed encouragement and it came from who? from Peter. This is why he took these men with him. This is why we've got our brothers and sisters and young people, because there are times where we have to put our hand up and say, you know, I need some help. I want some encouragement. And that's an okay thing. Even our Lord Jesus Christ did that at times. So a question for us, are we following Christ just for the benefits, the bread of life, just for what we get in the here and now? Or like Peter, for the love that we have for Christ, for his personality and value. We're following Jesus not simply because of the kingdom. We're following Jesus because we love him. We love his personality. We love his values. We love his principles. We want to be like him and with him. That's why we're here, not just for eternal life. <laughs> when many disciples were walking away, Peter individually affirmed his faith in Christ. Could you stand alone? You know, there were brothers and sisters, and we've been across to China, and they just are astounding examples of faith and fortitude in a tough environment. There's no big ecclesia for them. There's one or two brothers and sisters who have to survive just on their own. Do you, do you have that level? Because maybe we've got to take it up a notch or two. Peter clearly defined his comprehension of Christ as the Son of God. What, what, what's your, you know, we've got to make a personal definition for ourselves and make that real. And finally, Peter encouraged Christ by his strong affirmation and example, is Christ pleased with your walk of faith? In this beautiful scenario, Christ was just encouraged by what Peter was doing, by the affirmations that he gave. I wonder as Jesus looks down at our lives, what we've been doing, where we've been going, what we've been thinking, would Jesus be encouraged and would he be pleased with where we're at? These are the great lessons of Peter, the faithful companion of Jesus Christ. So we're going to have a look at uh, Peter, like we've really taken a lot of snapshots and we've really moved through his life quite quite dramatically, really. Uh, so it's a bit of a recap because I know a weekend can be a long time and you've probably already forgotten where do we start. So remember it was confession by the um, seashore and there Peter was sort of busy with his nets. He was sort of half listening to Christ and Christ wanted a decision to be made. And so Peter there began his journey. Uh, the next little snapshot we had was the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Peter, trying to show his definitive face to Christ, stepped out of the ecclesial boat, wanted to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ, learned the lesson that there are some things that only Jesus could achieve and that he was better back in the ecclesial boat. Uh, and then we had a look at this confidence on the mountain. Uh, an amazing 
uh, eyewitness account of the transformation of Jesus Christ, and that was very conclusive for Peter. It was a marking point in his life that this is where he wanted to be with his Lord and eventually in the kingdom and in glory. So coming to our third one now, uh, where we're going to spend a little bit of time with the, the Lord Jesus Christ and with his disciples. And, you know, there's a kerfuffle going on in the upper room. It's quite disastrous, really, because when you think about it, the Lord was only hours away from making this amazing gesture of love, that is, dying upon the cross in great agony and, and distress, we might even say, as far as uh, his, his physical side was concerned. And to have this environment where all the disciples are arguing as to who is the greatest uh, certainly could have derailed him. But our Lord, of course, was very focused, and he moved through that situation and educated his disciples at the same time. So when we come to the Gospel record of John, it's quite notable that John spends a quarter of his Gospel record on just a few hours. All right, so there's quite a few chapters, 21 chapters in John. Uh, five of them are devoted to just a few hours in the upper room. So we might even say this is a little bit dispro disproportionate uh, view of the Lord Jesus Christ. But for John, this was a very distinctive moment. Because here was the separation of Judas, who disappeared into the night, into the darkness, into the blackness, and never resuscitated himself. And the other disciples, of course, were still a little bit unaware as to what was going on. What's interesting about John, too, is he doesn't really record the memorials. Like, we would think, you know, that's the centre point, is that every Sunday morning we come together to celebrate the death and resurrection of Christ, and we commit by taking the memorials. It's interesting that John just simply bypasses that. But what, what he does focus on, of course, is really, I, I guess, the extension and the reality of what the emblems are all about. And that is serving one another, looking after one another. That's what the emblems really are. So if we sort of condition ourselves up just to take bread and wine, we think, well, that's, that's tick, done that for the week. Um, you know, that's not really living the life in Christ. So John really focuses on the practical reality of what these emblems were all about. So for the Lord, uh, there was mounting pressure, of course. He was soon to move out to the Garden of Gethsemane where he would pray to his father. And we know the stress that was on the Lord Jesus Christ at that particular time. But, you know, the beautiful thing about the Lord is that he, in some senses, the cross was not the final picture. The final picture was being in the presence with his father. And, you know, that's in this first verse. Like, I find this quite amazing. And, and I guess we sort of gloss over it really so this mounting pressure on Christ look at verse 1 now before the feast of Passover when Jesus knew that his hour was come and we sort of think okay that's the cross you know there's a few hours away well no it's not because read the verse the hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the father so his focus was 40 days away to when with great joy he would physically come into the presence of his father like that's amazing vision isn't it and maybe that's helpful for us when we go through difficult patches in our own lives that we don't get stuck down in, in that sort of little moment, but we sort of can look beyond to, to where we want to be in the kingdom with, with Christ because that's where Jesus' heart, mind and soul was at this particular time. So he wanted to be, of course, with his father. And in this little section of John, from John 13 through to the end of John 17, you'll see this emerge, if you ever want a colouring and exercise, it, it's a certainly a great exercise, uh, this focus that Jesus had on his Father. And you can see it straight away. I'm going unto the Father. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things and that he's come from God and went to God. Jesus wasn't sort of rattling around thinking, I don't know what's going to happen in the next few hours. I'm supposed to be crucified. I hope I can survive it. He had a definite vision and a confidence of where he wanted to be. And that's right at that front end. And that continues really uh, right through this whole section, as I said. Uh, and you can see this emerge in the way that he discussed with his disciples what the future was all about. So here in verse 12, I'm going to go unto my father. Verse 28, I go to the father. And right through this whole section of John, he's reminding the disciples, and this was an important point, you know, fellas, I'm not going to be here. I'm actually going to go and ascend to the father. And you guys will have to carry the, the message of the gospel. So underlying this sort of moment in the upper room, he's really educating these disciples. They need to develop a level of courage and faith to be able to stand on their own and witness 
the, uh, the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of, of God. So this is where Jesus was. So as we've got in verse 3, uh, again, in my Bible, I've got circled from verse 1 the word the Father, and then I've got it linked down to verse 3 where there's the word Father, and at the end of verse 3, the word God and God, because this is where Christ's vision was. This is what he was thinking about. Jesus knew where he was going to go, and he knew that God was with him. And it's the same for us. I mean, Paul wrote about that, didn't he, in Romans 8, 28. He says, we know that God will work all things for good. And we sort of cling to that passage sometimes when we're disturbed about life. We think, oh, I don't know, I can't make any sense of what's going on here. You know, I don't have a solution. I don't have a re re remedy. But what we do know, mm -hmm. brothers and sisters and young people, is that God is working behind the scenes to correct our mistakes and to help educate us on the way to the kingdom. We make bad decisions in life, but God can work with those bad decisions. We see that certainly in the life of Peter, and maybe we see it in our own lives as well. So Paul says, God will work all things for good. And Jesus, of course, fully understood that as well. Well, while Jesus had a focus on where he was going, and, and he knew the Father was in control of everything, for Peter, of course, well, this, this was a very disturbing uh, moment up in the upper room and so we've got a little bit of a snapshot of Peter's uh, emotions as they fluctuated you know his shock when Jesus bent down and started washing his own feet I mean that was a shock to Peter Jesus shouldn't be doing this he's the, he's the teacher he's the son of God uh, his stubbornness he didn't want that to happen his submission then his, his supposition his support and then finally his silence so you know he runs a whole range of different emotions in this particular upper room but even although he had this fluctuation there's a very lovely expression uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of verse 1 as well it says having loved his own which were in the world he loved them unto the end he loved them unto the uttermost he had a deep love now what's interesting in the Gospel of John from chapters 1 through to chapter 12 the word love occurs 12 times. Okay, so on average, once a chapter. From chapter 13 through to chapter 17, love occurs 34 times. So basically, seven times every chapter. So if you're a mathematician, you'd be saying like that's a 700% increase. So you can see the effusive love that the Lord Jesus Christ had started now to surface for his men. He loved them with all the mistakes and all the inadequacies they had. And of course, he prayed for them in John chapter 17, and he thanked the Father for the men that God had given him. And I wonder sometimes when we look around our ecclesia, whether we actually are truly thankful for the brothers and sisters that God, as a gift, has given to us. Yeah, with all our differences, and when you look at the 12, well, you look at the 11, of course, shortly, 11 disciples, they were all very different men, and they didn't all synchronise together and walk in step initially. But eventually through the work of Christ and through their own maturity, all these men that God gave as a gift to Jesus Christ in his prayer in John 17, he said, I thank you, Father, for these great men that you've given me. They've stood by me. They understand my, my purpose and I want you to be with them. So it's a wonderful prayer. So they were described as his own there in verse one, having loved his own. And when we describe things that are our own, we mostly refer to, well, all our possessions, all our assets in life. Might be a car, might be a house, it might be our investments. We all say, well, these are the things that I own. But that wasn't the perception of Jesus Christ. He gathered to himself his disciples and he said, that's what I own. That, that's what I, I love to connect to. And again, it's the same for ourselves. We need to develop this whole point of our camp, isn't it? Getting together as an ecclesia. Uh, creating those bonds of teamwork, walking together toward the kingdom, helping each other when we fall down. It's the point of this weekend and moving forward as well. So let's set the scene, verse 1, uh, before the feast of the Passover. So obviously the Passover is just a few hours away. And verse 2 goes on and it says, supper being ended. Well, you know, I love the King James, but that word ended needs to be crossed out because the supper hadn't been ended at all. Um, it's the Greek word ginomai, and it means to begin or under a way. So the supper meal had already commenced. That's the point. Uh, all, you might have an ESV or something, all manuscripts have basically, supper was now in progress. 
the evening meal was being served. And we know that, well, we know that supper hadn't ended because when you look at verse 26, um, you know, it's still in progress. Jesus is saying, well, I'm going to give some, some bread to Judas. So, you know, the meal was obviously still continuing. So if you've got the King James, you can cross out the word ended and put the word, you know, in progress. And there's an important point as to why that's happening. Because something had been left undone. All right. Something had been left undone. And the disciples have sort of assembled in, you know, elbowed each other out the road to get the, the best position. And now the meal was commencing, but something had been left undone. And so as the meal begins to be in progress, it was quite staggering for the disciples to note Jesus moved from reclining and he girded a towel around himself and he went and got a basin and he started to wash the disciples' feet. So, you know, back, oh, we don't do it now, I guess. We don't have a basin by the door and, you know, say to our guests, well, you know, wash your own feet. Uh, but we don't wash their feet. But, you know, it was a culture, it was a custom back then because they had sandals, dusty roads, they come inside. And as a gesture from the host, he would wipe their, or the servant probably would wipe their feet and then they'd come in. It was part of the culture at the time. So you can imagine the disciples coming in. They see this basin here by the door. What do you think they thought? You know? Well, there's no servant there to uh, to wash their feet, and they're probably quite happy to get the towel and to wash Jesus' feet. But I guess if one of them picked up the towel, he'd be thinking, I've got to now wash everybody else's feet, so I'm not going to pick up the towel. And 12 men went through. Nobody bothered to pick up the towel. So they're all pointing down to, I guess, that basin, metaphorically, and saying, well, that's someone else's job. That's not my job. Somebody else can be doing that. I'm a little better than most of the other disciples, so, you know, it's not my task to bend down and wash everyone's feet. So the reality is that 12 men plus Christ came in, nobody's feet was washed. So there's a, a comment that I think is, is quite um, poignant, really. It picks up the whole <coughs> environment of this room. <coughs> it says, The room was filled with proud hearts and dirty feet. The disciples were willing to fight for a throne, but not for a tower. See, they still had to grow in their maturity. That our work in the truth is about service and support and helping each other. It's not about elbowing one another out for a higher position. So these disciples, of course, had to learn this particular lesson. And as well as that, when we look at the comparative record, it says that there was a dispute going on as to who was the greatest. Now, that's particularly sad, really, as far as the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned, that he, <coughs> here, in these final moments, they were still, still arguing. So, you know, the disciples all had a different approach. <coughs> John, perhaps, was a little bit pensive. Peter was very defensive. Judas was withdrawn. Thomas was probably a little bit moody. Philip was confused as to what was going on. And... They all tried to position themselves <clears throat> in a different location. <clears throat> so this picture here is a very famous picture. Leonardo da Vinci, you might have heard of him. <laughs> Great painter. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> this is the, the Last Supper, of course, which is very famous. But as we have here, it's terribly inaccurate. <clears throat> Jesus and the disciples reclined. They didn't sit at the table. And you notice know, across here, well, here's John. He's the youngest, of course. We can see that. Here's Peter. He's got a little knife in his hand here. And here's Judas. He's got a, a bag of money on the table there. So it's sort of interesting to see Leonardo da Vinci's take on the 12 disciples. But that's not how they position themselves. And it probably is important because we'll note in verse 24 of this chapter that Peter had to beckon to John to ask Jesus who was the disciple that was going to betray him. <clears throat> so it was probably more something like this, <clears throat> where the disciples reclined, and uh, this was, was perhaps how they would position themselves. I'm not quite sure that Jesus would have been in the centre, because what I've looked up a little bit, bit of research, <clears throat> and there's a particular position across here uh, that the important guests would have, which would give them access generally to uh, the, the servants, uh, or if they had to go out and conduct business, they would be able to exit from here pretty easily. <clears throat> but anyway, this gives us a bit of an idea. Jo uh, Peter obviously was right over here. He wasn't close to the Lord. 
because he had to say to John, ask Jesus who it is that is going to betray me. <clears throat> so across here, probably Jesus in the middle here, uh, John on this side and maybe Judas on the other side. This one gives us a bit of a, a plan view. <clears throat> so it gives us a bit of an idea of how they're all positioned. So as we say from verse 26, Peter had to beckon unto John, ask Jesus, you know, what's going on? Who's going to betray him? So it meant that Judas and John were both close to the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse 4, <coughs> we read that Christ laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. Now again, that's uh, quite an amazing gesture that was really an exhortation in itself. Uh, and really, with the Lord doing that, uh, it's appropriate to have that connection back to the work of the priests in the uh, temple and in the tabernacle because this is how they would dress. The priests would be just in white linen garments, garments for service, and uh, this really was the uh, clothing of the Lord Jesus Christ. He took off the outer garment. It would just be a, a white garment. He took a towel with himself as well, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. So... Five minutes on each disciple? Well, that's an hour. So, you know, I, I guess we sort of imagine, well, Jesus washed their feet all over, move on with the story. But when you think about it, if Jesus took five minutes on each disciple, maybe he took a bit less, I don't know. But that's an hour. That's an hour where nobody says anything. Jesus just moves around washing the feet of the disciples until he gets last to Peter. And we know Peter's last because... Christ in the narrative says, well, now you're all clean except for one. So, And that's after uh, his conversation with Peter in verse 9. So, you know, an hour has gone by and all we hear is the sound of water uh, and, and feet being washed. And no one said anything because they'd be all be thinking, what's going on? And it was really quite, in some ways, a demeaning task. Like it was the task of a servant. Um, I'm going to reference Abigail. Remember David and Abigail? Um, Nabal sort of was a, a very foolish man, but Nabal was a wealthy man and so was Abigail. Abigail was his wife. Well, Nabal died and Abigail was taken into marriage by David. So Abigail was a very prestigious woman. She had a lot of assets. She was very, very wealthy. Listen to what she said to David, 1 Samuel 25, verse 41. It says she bowed herself on her face to the earth and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of thy servants of my Lord. Like what an amazing humility Abigail had. And that was really an extreme action of humility on her part. So for the Lord Jesus Christ to do this, of course, he was fully displaying his uh, service to his disciples. And it was obviously a very powerful exhortation. So now that Peter's last, when we come to verse 10, or verse not, well, really, let's go back to verse 8. Peter says to Christ, you're not going to wash my feet. I can imagine sort of a, a pretty interesting conversation. We talk about robust conversations before, and here's another one coming up. Jesus moved around, all the disciples washed their feet. He gets to Peter, and Peter says, you're not washing my feet. In fact, the Greek is really, really strong. Um, Peter said, oh, did that jump? No, Peter said, I'll never let my feet be washed by you, never. That's Weymouth translation. So there's two double negatives in the Greek. So there's a vehemence all, almost uh, injected into the narrative here. Rotherham says, <coughs> in no wise shall you ever wash my feet. Pretty definitive, pretty straight down the line and probably characteristic of Peter. So remember we talked earlier today when we looked at Matthew 16, when Peter grabbed the Lord and the Lord said, look, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified. And Peter said, never, never will this happen to you. And he rebuked the Lord. Well, the same's happening here. So there's a little bit of tension. Peter's used the same double negative. He's very extreme. But what's beautiful about the relationship is Peter was very protective of Christ. He's not, he's not doing a bad thing in that sense. He's protective of the Lord Jesus Christ and he respected Christ. 
he didn't feel it was the position of this great teacher, this son of God, to be down on his hands and knees washing the disciples' feet. <clears throat> so for Peter, you know, it was quite confronting. So we'll notice, of course, uh, that Peter engages in a conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ and he learns really the definition of what service and life in the truth is all about. He felt Jesus should not submit, should not suffer and shouldn't have to serve. But by the end of the day, of course, Jesus is going to be doing all of those things. He's going to serve, he's going to submit, he's going to suffer on the cross. But this was a lesson that Peter learnt and he writes about it in his epistle and he picks out this word girded. So you'll notice in verse 4, this word girded with a towel and Peter lifts that word out and puts it across in his epistle. If you haven't got the reference, you need to put it in. First Peter 5 verse 5. And here is this particular word. So it says he girded himself. There's the Greek word there. It doesn't occur anywhere else in the New Testament. Uh, made up of a, a particular Greek word that talks about, you know, it's it's a slave's apron, essentially. He put on a slave or a servant's apron. It related to, to Peter particularly, and so he uses it here across in 1 Peter 5, and it's in the context of service and not in promotion. So, you know, they were all arguing as to, you know, where they wanted to sit and connect to Christ as a position of honour. Peter picks that up in his narrative and says, look, don't be proud, people. Um, it's not about authority. It's not about kingship this side of the kingdom. He says, you younger, submit yourselves under the elder, be subject to one another. And here he says, gird yourself with humility. That's exactly the same Greek word. And then he uses these terms, humble here. So did Peter get the lesson? Yeah, obviously, because he wrote it about it in his epistle. Well, of course, Jesus says in verse 7, Peter, what I'm doing now, you don't fully understand, but you will know later. And of course, there's the example of that in Peter's epistle and in his life. He spent the rest of his life really um, serving his brethren. Now, I guess for us, we've got to think about this. <clears throat> Are we humble enough to accept the help that other brothers and sisters offer? I mean, I think for all of us, we're, we're, we're pretty good at giving help and we like to give help. We see someone else in distress or someone else going through a difficult time. You know, we send them an SMS or write them a card or we jump around, we visit with the morning, we do all these wonderful things, we ring them up saying, is there something I can do? But when we're the ones in need and people offer, we say, no, no, I'm fine, thanks. You know what? We're, we're sort of mirroring the really the attitude of Peter, saying, no, no, I don't need any help. I'm, I'm fine. I'm good. Uh, so, you know, when we look a little bit disparagingly at Peter and say, well, you know, you'd think he'd learn the lesson, allow Christ to wash his feet. Maybe we haven't learnt that lesson either. And, uh, you know, maybe we're a little bit proud and, and a bit resistant to allowing people to help us. So, you know, sometimes we, we struggle with issues and I'm going uh, in my own family to Nat and Danny, Joey and Jared. They couldn't have kids for a long, long time, 10 years. Uh, it, they got to a point where we were overseas and Nat rang us and he said, Mum, Dad, We've had IVF, we're going to have one last try after this, you know, where do we go? We don't know what we're going to do, but please pray for us. And we said, and Nat and Danny, Jared and Joey, we said, hey guys, we've been praying for you for a long, long time, so it's not something new that we're going to initiate. But I thought it was an interesting point where a crisis had been suddenly, sort of a line had been drawn, and they put their hand up and said, hey, we need some help, please pray for us. And I wonder sometimes, brothers and sisters, if we're a little bit resistant. We've got that bit of that Peter attitude in us that, you know what, I'll, I'll plough on. I'll be okay. I don't need any help. So, you know, we perhaps need to uh, revisit that a little bit. And the thing is, um, this, this one here, this picture here, uh, would you allow Jesus to wash your feet? So this is the thing. It's easy for us to look at the disciples and say, well, you know, it's pretty obvious Jesus was teaching him a lesson. But, you know, if that was you in that position and the Lord was at your feet, washing your feet, how would you feel? You know, do we think in our lives that there's some grime or some mud or some sin 
or some history that we've got that Jesus can't remove. And I know there are brothers and sisters that do think that and they find it just too overwhelming and they just throw their hands up and, and leave the truth because they think in their own lives there's some mud that Jesus can't remove and he can. It's the whole point and he wants to. You know, he wants to get down at our feet and he wants to wash any misdeeds that we've done and remove them so that as a, as a bride, we appear before him without spot and without blemish. I mean, that's the words of Ephesians. He looks at us and we're perfect. It's amazing. <laughs> so sometimes let's not be overwhelmed with, uh, you know, the distractions of life. We need to allow the whole process of forgiveness uh, and confession before Christ to resolve those issues and not be like Peter in this particular moment and say, no, you know, that can't be done. So we need to uh, allow the Lord Jesus Christ options there. And in fact, when we don't bother with the readings, you know what we're saying? You know, I, I don't need to have this washing process. I mean, the whole point of the, the water of the word, we might say, helps to recalibrate our day. I mean, we've found that in life. You know, at the end of the day, you're opening the Bible, you're thinking, wow, it's been a messy day, but wow, look at the exciting events that are happening and you do a reading. And that's, you know, a washing process for us, putting the day in perspective. Sometimes we say, you know what, I've had a busy day, I can't be bothered with the readings. We're actually saying, you know what, I don't need my feet washed today. <laughs> so, you know, we, we need to be, uh, be careful about that. So this is what the comment is in verse 8. Um, Jesus says... If I don't wash you, Peter, you've got no connection with me. Um, fairly strong language. A few other versions say, Peter, you won't have anything in common with me. So Peter, as we know there in verse 9, beautifully flips over, <laughs> as he's known to do, to the other extreme. And he gets the point and he says, well, you know what, Lord? Not only my feet, but my hands and my head. Now, that's not just a random comment, is it? Like when we think about our feet, hands and head, uh, they're, they're aspects of our walk in Christ, you know, our thinking, uh, what we put our hand to, the direction we take uh, in life. And Peter immediately gets the point. So he's quite perceptive. In fact, it's interesting when you look at Judas, have a look at verse 27, we've got this feet, hands and head being repeated. Because in verse 27, here's Judas' feet, uh, Jesus said, what are you going to do, Judas? Go do it. Judas gets on his feet and walks out the door, right? <clears throat> his hands, of course, in verse 29, says he had the bag. He's the one with his hands. He held the bag and he was taking money out of it. He was a cheat. He held the bag. And then, of course, his head, verse 30, he went out and it was night. It was dark. It was black. I mean, it's an interesting comment by John there. He's not just saying, well, it's dark outside. I mean, that's obvious. But what he's saying is Judas disappeared into the night because that's where his mind was, blackness, darkness. So Christ provided this very uh, beautiful lesson there in verse 10 where he explains the washing process. And, of course, we know it begins at baptism. We know that's part of our, our walk toward the kingdom. But, of course, it's ongoing for us as well. We don't have a perfect life after baptism so we need our feet washed constantly. And, and in some ways, the memorials are like that. It's, a, it's a, a routine and a cycle that we go through. We come here before the table of the Lord. We think about our life. We recalibrate ourselves uh, and, and we move forward. So our Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is constantly involved in that process. And so we need to be able to be honest with ourselves and to show our need of Christ's saving method now let's think about washing feet you know sometimes uh in ecclesial life we need to wash one another's feet now i don't mean that physically but what i mean is sometimes brothers and sisters need help and support encouragement counsel and guidance so how do we do that well sometimes you know we can put a a, a bucket of boiling water because we're going to treat these brothers and sisters uh, who have offended us, and uh, we're going to treat them quite roughly. So, you know, we get a bucket of hot water, and we say, put your feet in here. You know, it's boiling water, we're angry, you know, we are repulsed with what's going on, and so we, we plunge their feet into boiling water. Well, 
sure you've seen that happen in ecclesial life. Or you can go to the opposite, of course, icy cold water. Um, you know, of course, we disconnect from this particular brother or sister or family. There's no warmth. There's no warmth in, in how we deal with the situation. And so we get a bucket of frigid cold icy water and we plunge their feet in it and say, you know, this is, what, this is a remedy. Uh, we numb their feet. Or maybe we don't use any water at all. You know, we get a bit of sandpaper or some sort of wire brush and we're going you know, to think, we're going to scrub this, you know, brother, sister, what have you done? We're going to clean your feet up. So away we go with a bit of sandpaper. So we've all had those, you know, rough experiences, I guess. So sometimes no water at all. So there's no, you know, soft towel of, of service. There's no compassion. Um, we point out people's deficiencies. And it's very different to what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing here. So, of course, the Lord is teaching Peter, we've got to wash one another's feet with compassion, with service, with humility, hoping for a right and a good outcome. And that's a service that we can all do, all do isn't it? So here we have this little comment here. Uh, it says, if there's a position in the ecclesia where the... Uh, a worker will have to toil hard and get no thanks uh, and be pleased with it. If you can perform a service which few will ever seek to do themselves or appreciate it when performed by others, do it with delight. Covet humble work and when you get it, be content to continue in it. There is no great rush after the lowest places. You'll rob no one by seeking them. There are some things in ecclesial life that aren't honourable, we might say, or, or they don't have a lot of promotion. And not everybody's uh, concerned about those tasks. But this writer is saying, hey, get in and do those ones because you're not going to have to elbow anyone out because no one else is wanting to do them. So there are many tasks in ecclesial life that we can do behind the scenes that are really important and really helpful. Being a good doorman is one. Now, we've got a good doorman at Golden Grove, Brother Dave Van Bergen. He's on the door every single Sunday. He's got a beaming smile. He either tells me that I've, I smell nice or I've got a, a, a beautiful tie, <laughs> which is very complimentary. But, you know, the, see, he's an example to me of a brother who works behind the scenes and he's there. He thinks it's his task every single Sunday. He's in the foyer. He welcomes us. It's great to see him there. Or you might be a sister uh, who can get on a committee and you're excellent at organising. So, you know, people might not know that you, you're on that particular committee, but you've got a, a skill in organising. It's behind the scenes. Nobody notices. Uh, so these are, these are tasks that we can inject ourselves into in ecclesial life. Well, as we say, Peter was the last one in verse uh, 10 and 11. And interesting, uh, look at verse 11 or, or the end of verse 9. He says, you're clean, but not all. Now, just have a think. We know who Christ was referring to, but at the time, the disciples didn't know. So it could be any of them. So he's, he's moved around, he's washed the feet of 12 men, and he says, well, now you're clean, but wait a minute, not all. And he says it again in verse 11. Uh, he knew he was going to betray him, therefore he said, you're not all clean. I wonder who felt awkward after that particular statement. I wonder whether Peter felt a little bit awkward because was he the one that Christ was referring to and, and would have been the other disciples as well. Christ didn't name anyone, we know, because we're at the back end of the story. But of course, it would have been a time of introspection because they'd be thinking, is that me? My feet not clean? Is that relating to me? So then Jesus goes on in verse 12 through to verse 17, and he, he gives them an exhortation on the value of humility and service. And he points out, particularly in verse 18, that he says... Uh, the one who is not clean, whose feet are not clean, he's actually pulled his foot away from me. You see that at the end of verse 18? Someone pulled their feet away from me. I wonder who that was. Well, we know Peter was, he pulled his feet away. But maybe Judas did as well as a, as a, a fulfilment of the, the psalm. He pulled his feet away. Don't know, interesting to think about it. Here's the psalm here, Psalm 41, verse 9. My own familiar friend in whom I trusted uh, has lifted up his heel against me. So that's what Christ is quoting. Of course, it's relating to Ahithophel back in the times of David, who once was David's familiar friend. They worshipped together. And 
and of course he he turned his life around so uh again for peter this and for all the disciples really it was a period of introspection had they been the ones really that had pulled their feet away was christ referring to them so it was of course quite a sobering moment you'll notice in verse 21 and again a little interesting insight into the emotions of jesus Jesus wasn't unaffected by what was going on in the room. See verse 21? It says, he was troubled in spirit. You know, the literal Greek is to boil water. The Greek word is terasso, and it means to physically shake or to boil in water, to be visibly disturbed. So John's writing this record, and he senses and he sees the distress of Jesus Christ. Yeah, we, we well, I do. I was tend to think you know this is all just happening and jesus know where are you going to go and what's going to happen it all runs smoothly but you can see the, the the compassion that christ has even for a man like judas who made a really bad mistake and he's troubled jesus is actually shaking it's actually the same word that's translated groaned in chapter 11 and verse 31 remember back in the time of lazarus who died and jesus came before the tomb and the word is when he saw that and what was going on, he groaned. It's that word here as well. So, you know, it shows the full spectrum of the, the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he was concerned with what, what was happening here. But I think for all the disciples, again, they were unsure of what Christ was referring to them. So for them all, they were sort of a period of introspection. Well, verse 24, Peter wants to know who this betrayer is he obviously sort of thinks well we need to know who this is and so he gestures as we said to john who's on the right side of jesus to ask jesus the question who is it who is it so he wants to know uh who this is and again um the lord responds uh in an appropriate manner he doesn't openly display it's judas in fact, it appears that the disciples, perhaps apart from John, uh, didn't know that Judas was the one who would betray him. But in verse uh, 36 and 37, uh, Peter's got another conversation because maybe he's a little bit concerned with his, with his own uh, pathway. And so verse 36 and 37, he says, Lord, where are you going? Because Christ has said, well, you can't come in verse 33. You can't follow me. And Peter's really concerned. He says, uh, where, are you, where are you going? Why can't I follow you? In verse 37, why can't I follow you now? So he wants to give Christ this reassurance that he was going to be faithful and he was going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, which is interesting compared to our comment in the previous study when he tried to dissuade Jesus from a particular pathway. He's now recalibrated, said, look, I'm going to follow you. I'm not going to step in front of you. I'm now, I've learned the lesson. I'm going to follow you, but I want to go wherever you go. And Christ says, you can't do that. And he says, well, why not? So Peter, of course, has to come to an understanding of what that was all about. But the lovely thing about Peter is he was so passionate about Christ. And three times he says to Christ, um, I'm going to follow you and I'm going to give my life to you. It's quite astounding, really. And here are these three times. Here we're looking at in verse 37. He says, I'm going to follow you and I'll lay down my life for you. He says it again in Mark chapter 14. And again there in verse 29 and verse 31. Here in the upper room, on the way to Gethsemane and in Gethsemane. There's the three occasions there. And that's why this number three starts to happen and why um, Jesus says you'll deny me three times, and why Christ came to Peter three times uh, in, the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. So there's uh, quite an intensity of love as far as Peter is concerned. Well, you know, Jesus said you can't do it now, but he wants to follow Christ now. And of course, he says he's ready to go, he's ready to follow Jesus. And we know what the, the outcome of that was. But, you know, very beautiful words, I think in verse 37, we don't want to skip over the intent of these words. Peter says, Lord, why can't I follow you now? And look at this next phrase. I'm going to lay down my life for you. That's a pretty big commitment. That's a pretty big statement, isn't it? 
I'm going to lay down my life for you. I don't know whether any of us really would ever get to that level of commitment. You know, we're comfortable here in Australia. We've got a great environment. We've got security. We've got protection. We've got freedom. Um, would you be courageous enough to say, I'll give my life for Christ? Because this is really what, this is what Peter said here. And this is the definition of that love by Jesus himself. He says, greater love is no man than this, than someone who's prepared to lay down his life for his friends. Peter is that man. I mean, Christ in the fullness, obviously. But Peter was prepared to lay down his life for Jesus Christ, if that's what it took. That's an amazing affirmation. And you can imagine the Lord Jesus Christ in these moments before the cross, in these moments before the darkness of Gethsemane, to hear a statement like that would have really made his heart beat a little bit faster, wouldn't it? I'm ready to go now, and I'm ready to lay down my life for you. And of course, Paul in Romans picks up a similar uh, concept. He says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. You know, for someone who's righteous, you might think, well, you know what, I'll give my life up for that person because they're a better person. God commends his love towards us, and while we're sinners, Christ died for us. So Peter said, I'm ready to die for you, Lord, here and now. You know, that always triggers off for me a bit of a memory. 1999, in the Columbine shooting disaster, it was sort of the beginning, really, of some of these um, active shooters back in 1999. I don't know if you remember the story, but there was uh, a couple of girls who were Christians, and these guys came in, you know, with guns and started shooting, and the story goes that uh, one of them put a gun against one of these girls and said, I want you to renounce your belief in Christ. And she said, no, I'm not. I'm a Christian. And so he shot her. And I always think in that moment, if someone put a gun to my head and said, renounce your, your belief in God, which way would I go? And for Peter, it's quite astounding. He says, I'm prepared to lay down my life. <laughs> and he would. And he did. Like he, he fulfilled his statement. So for uh, Peter, just an amazing uh, confirmation of his love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to come across to Luke chapter 22 because there's a, 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 a private message, we might say. Luke 22, verse 31. Sort of a, a, a parallel here, a parallel gospel record, but just some added detail. So Luke 22, verse 31. Again, the emblems have happened there. Uh, in verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, the adversary has desired to have you and he's going to assist you as wheat. But I have prayed for you and when your, that your faith fails not when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. So, you know, why this private message to Peter? Well, of course, the adversary was the Sanhedrin who were looking for some sort of uh, leverage as far as the disciples were concerned. Could they cause a disciple to defect? And to give witness uh, before the Sanhedrin that Christ was claiming to be the Son of God and that would be blasphemy. Well, Peter had made that statement. So there was probably some pressure that was going to be applied on Peter. His name was going to come up in the Sanhedrin. Um, so he was perhaps the next target as well. And it says that Christ prayed for Peter. Now, just have a think about that. That's quite a powerful comment, isn't it? Uh, I think uh, Brother Roberts in Nazareth Revisitor says, Christ probably meant that the authorities who were plotting his destruction would try to corrupt the fidelity of the disciples one by one should Judas fail them. So Judas already defected. And that Peter would be in a special danger from such a process, in more danger than the others it would seem, for he prayed specially for Peter that the temptation might not be too much for him. So, you know, Peter could have gone... Either way, really. And Jesus had made a special prayer that Peter's faith would be sustained. What a powerful prayer that would be. What a wonderful connection the Lord had with this beautiful man that really offered his life in service for, for Christ himself. And we've got to realize that we're in that same position, that our Lord Jesus Christ intercedes in our lives too. You know, we read these stories, and wow, that's interesting, uh, thinking about Christ actually praying that Peter might have strength. But he does the same in our lives. Not that he prays, but he intercedes. He's working in our lives. He loves us. He wants us to get to the kingdom. He'll do anything he can to help 
make that happen. So it has a very personal application to us. Hebrews 7.25 says, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. So that whole process uh, is, is being repeated, of course. Well, what we need to understand, of course, is that Peter never doubted uh, the veracity and the authenticity of Jesus Christ and how that would eventually have its full outworking. So, you know, his disturbance here is not in Christ, but it's in his own failures. And this is, this is the picture that will open up uh, to us, of course, in our, in our exhortation tomorrow morning. So for Peter, this was uh, a very helpful education. And we notice across the page, just very briefly, uh, that this conversion process... Uh, Christ says, when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. The beginning of that conversion process is in chapter 22 and verse 62. A very short verse. It just says, Peter went out and wept bitterly. That was the beginning of the conversion of Peter. In that moment of distress, when he lost faith in himself and he realized that he needed Christ, he did a 180 degree turnaround and uh, he, he connected to the example of, and the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. He realized that he couldn't achieve the kingdom on his own. And he was going to, of course, strengthen his brethren. So that word conversion uh, is, is an interesting Greek word. Uh, it's this word here, and it means to move forward. So when you've gone past, when you've learned from this experience, Peter, you need to move forward. This is the conversion process and an education process through which you will help as, as an example and a support to your brothers and sisters. So in a few hours, Peter's going to be the only one who's going to draw a sword. He's going to fling himself in front of 200 soldiers because he wanted to defend the man that he loved. It shows an amazing passion that he had for Christ, an unquenchable passion. I wonder where we would position ourselves. You know, if we sort of latched onto this group of disciples and we trailed behind uh, through the streets of Jerusalem, up into Gethsemane, and there's a bunch of soldiers coming, where would we position ourselves amongst those disciples? Would we be with Peter, defending the Lord, or would we be sort of running for our life? So Peter stands out as an amazing personality. He's got a lot of embarrassing situations that are happening to him. He's been corrected in front of his brethren. In front of his brethren, Christ informed them all that Peter would deny him three times. I mean, that's got to be embarrassing. Uh, he's going to be sleeping in the Garden of Gethsemane when he should have been awake. Uh, he's, he's going to defect and deny that he knew the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a, there's a massive education process that's going to happen in the next few hours. But from a denying disciple to a devoted servant, that's the lineal pathway of Peter. And he became unwavering and resolute in his love for Jesus Christ. And that's the challenge for us, brothers and sisters, in the age in which we live, do we have 100% passion for our Lord Jesus Christ? We want to be with him, and when he appears, we'll embrace him and we'll love him. Is that where we're at? Because that's the example of Peter. And Peter provides us, you know, with some wonderful uh, expressions. Christ says, strengthen your brethren, and he did. He wrote an epistle to strengthen his brethren, and he uses that, that word strengthen there, is this word established. And so years later, Peter wrote an epistle, a letter to his brothers and sisters to establish them, to strengthen them. I mean, it's not the, the, the course of our study uh, this weekend, but that's showing the maturity of Peter. So what have we learnt tonight? Are we trying to impress each other and gain a more authoritative spiritual position above others or recognise, like Peter, that we all have an equality in Christ, that we're all valued by our Lord Jesus Christ. No need to elbow one another out of the way. We all want to be in the kingdom. Are we prepared to wash one another's feet in humility of service and not with hot or icy water or rough, brutal methods? We've got to wash each other's feet. This is the whole point of the lesson of Christ. It's service, support, advice, help assistance to each other it's, it's what our life in the truth should be all about do we fully appreciate that christ has bent down to wash our feet in amazing gesture of love and we, we look at peter and we see that picture and we think yeah why didn't peter get it well, you know what maybe we don't get it either but our lord jesus christ 
and he's bent down, he's washed my feet. Amazing. And he's washed your feet as well. That's incredible. Uh, through what he went through so that we could have an opportunity for life. And would you be prepared to lay down your life for Christ? Peter was, and he eventually did. That's the challenge of this wonderful character, this wonderful person, this wonderful disciple who had an indefatigable love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that encourages us to deepen our relationship with Christ. I hope we've been impressed in this little short period of time, you know, just a little snapshot of Peter's dedication and his love for the Lord Jesus Christ, despite all his inadequacies. And I think this is comforting for us as, as well, because sometimes as we go through life, we just feel that we're unworthy to be called a brother and sister of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that beautiful gesture that Christ has provided for us of inviting us to be with him in the kingdom is just quite amazing. But of course, he reached out for Peter. Peter reached out for him. And that's the point of our whole exercise this morning. And it was uh, a rather difficult time for Peter as well. He'd been corrected in front of his brethren. So remember the scene last night. Uh, they're here at the Last Supper. Um, there's, there's 12 disciples plus the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter gets, Christ gets to Peter right at the end. And there's this conversation where Peter says, no, you're not going to wash me. And Christ says, well, if I, I don't wash you, you've got no part or no connection with, you, with me. And then, of course, Peter proclaims his connection and his faithfulness and his loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ says, you know what, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. That's in front of all the other brethren. All right, so we come here this morning, and I don't know how your week has been, but I guess there, there may have been distractions in our week that have taken us on a wrong pathway. Mostly that's private. It's not in front of our brothers and sisters where for Peter, it would be quite embarrassing. Uh, he said how connected he was to Jesus, and Christ said in front of his brethren, no, Peter, you're going to betray me three times. That's very confronting. And not only that, but when we come back to Mark chapter 14 and look at verse uh, 29, Peter says it a second time. You know, Peter has this amazing persistency. He wants to be faithful to Christ. And when we come to verse 29, you'll notice that uh, back in verse 26, it said they, they're on their way out to the Mount of Olives. So the upper room was the first proclamation. Now they're on their way to the Mount of Olives. And Peter says it again in verse 29, although, and he points to almost all the disciples, like, I'm, I'm sure we wouldn't do that. You know, this brother and this sister, I'm going to give better service than they've ever given. Like, that's quite out there, confronting. Well, he says that in verse 29. And then a third time in verse 31. Amazing, isn't it? Jesus says, no, you're going you're to betray me three times. And, and verse 31 says, Peter spake the more vehemently. Uh, Diaglot says on verse 30, indeed, and this is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, I say unto thee that thou this day, this night before the cock crows twice, you will disown me thrice. So, you know, we've talked about the robustness of the conversation between Christ and Peter, and here it is again. You're going to deny me. In verse 31, Peter insisted emphatically, says the New English Translation. Uh, the Bible in basic English said he said it with a passion. NASB says, but Peter kept, Peter kept on saying insistently. Like, you've got to admire the man for his enthusiasm and his energy for Christ. I mean, if it was me, I would have backed off probably on the first statement, you know, and got in the back of the queue with the rest of the disciples. But Peter's out there on the front. He's determined to lock in that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the Greek, it's a double negative. Not, not will I deny you. Now, let's have a think about our own lives and our own commitment. Wind back to our, you know, emergence out of the waters of baptism. I'm pretty sure that's probably the statement we're all saying, sort of in our own hearts and minds. As we came out of the wars of baptism, this is going to be a straight course to the kingdom. I'm going to be faithful. It's going to be a short course. It's only a couple of years away. I'm sure Jesus will return in a couple of years. 
well, for some of us, that was like 30, 40, 50 years ago. <laughs> so I think the question is, and the challenge is, uh, could we utter with the same fervency for the week ahead that we will commit our lives faithfully to the Lord Jesus Christ and that we will not deny him and that we will give service above and beyond what our brothers and sisters are, are providing? That's a very big claim. But you know what? The Lord would actually appreciate a commitment like that. I wonder whether sometimes we're pretty half-hearted. We come along Sunday, it's sort of a routine thing. We take bread and we take wine and we drift through the week. And I think we, we really need the challenge of Peter's life, his personality and his character to stop us in our tracks and to realise that this is what Christ wants. He wants us to commit faithfully and passionately. And so the Lord goes into Gethsemane in verse 32. They've wandered through the streets of Jerusalem. Now in verse 32, he takes with him three of his disciples. It's Peter, James and John. Uh, they had accompanied the Lord Jesus Christ on three unique occasions. One at the home of Jairus when his daughter was raised, at the Mount of Transfiguration and, of course, here um, in Gethsemane. Now the question is, um, why did Jesus take these three men? You know, if, if it was me, I'd want just a quiet time by myself to focus on the hours and the task that is ahead. Why did Jesus take these three men into close proximity there in the Garden of Gethsemane? And one of the reasons is this, because Christ needed Peter. You know, we tend to think our Lord Jesus Christ was focused on the cross and where he had to go, and beyond that, he was going to be in the presence of his Father. But he too needed that human companionship, just as we do, brothers and sisters. You know, how nice it is in times of doubt or distress or when things haven't been going too well, we get a phone call from a brother or sister and they say, how are you going? And there's that sort of feeling that, well, somebody, somebody loves me somewhere. And, uh, you know, there's that connection we appreciate. And our Lord Jesus Christ wanted, he wanted these three men to be in close proximity with him, especially Peter, who was the verbal encourager, who was the man who wore his heart on his sleeve. He said it as he thought it. And he was honest about his passion and love for Christ. And as that intensity for Jesus reached a crisis point, he wanted especially Peter, James and John to be with him. Sometimes our major battles in life aren't witnessed by, you know, the Ecclesia or lots of other brothers and sisters. Sometimes it's just a quiet coffee with a brother or a sister. And we pour out our heart to this particular brother or sister over a coffee. Nobody else sees where we're at or what we're going through. But aren't they renewing and helpful times? And that's exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ is doing here. He wanted to be with his brethren on the front line in the intensity of his own um, anguish. And he says that in verse 34. Uh, we get an insight really into how the Lord was feeling. He wasn't robotic. Look at verse 34. My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Stop here with me. Diaglot says, my soul is encompassed with a deadly anguish. There's nothing artificial about the feelings of Christ. He wasn't putting it some facade on uh, to these three disciples. Uh, one translation says, he began to be filled with horror and deep distress. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. So for our Lord Jesus Christ, he needed some companionship. He needed these men about him. And, you know, in the English here, this little phrase, very heavy, is the Greek word adamonio. It's the strongest of three Greek words in the New Testament for depression. All right, so our Lord Jesus Christ wasn't just artificially uh, heading to the cross without any anguish encompassing him. He really needed his brethren alongside of him. And, of course, strong prayer to the Father, which Hebrews says, was with crying and tears. And of course, the Father dispatched an angel to be alongside Jesus Christ to give another level of encouragement. And as we know, Psalm 69 verse 20 says, Reproach has broken my heart. I look for comforters, but I found none. Not even Peter, who was so sensitised to the feelings of the Lord, was able to connect in this difficult moment. Well, we notice in verse 37 that our Lord Jesus Christ comes three times seeking for encouragement and support. 
So here in verse 37, it says he comes and he finds them sleeping. And he says to Peter, Simon, it's his own name, his old name. Remember, that means hearing. <laughs> it's a bit of a play, I guess. Simon, um, you're not listening. You're not hearing. You're actually asleep. And the Lord comes three times. And it wasn't really in some senses, this expression wasn't a criticism of Peter. It's just that Christ wanted to talk to him. What an exhausting time for these men. You know, they prepared for the Passover. They'd been there all night. They traversed the streets of Jerusalem. They've come up to Gethsemane. These are men who spent long hours on the water in a boat, who knew tough environment, you know, who had an absolutely amazing stamina. Even they could not sustain themselves in this moment. And it makes us think about the stamina of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like, what an incredible moment for the Lord. Well, he's looking for comfort and support. Verse 37, he comes. Verse 40, he returns. Verse 41, he cometh the third time. Uh, and that's interesting that the narrative here in Mark records that third time, is it? Because three times Peter has said, I'm going to be with you, Lord. And three times, of course, the Lord returned to seek that encouragement. And his comment is, couldn't you be with me for one hour? I wonder sometimes during the week we get so exhausted that when it comes to spending time with our Heavenly Father in prayer, we just don't have the stamina. You know, we've had a busy day. You know, we need to look after the kids. Uh, there's problems at work and there's stresses there. We have a long, long day. And we go to bed, we fall asleep, and we never take the time to talk to our Heavenly Father about our day because we're tired. So I think what our Lord Jesus Christ is telling us, if we really have a close relationship with the Father, that we need to define and spend some time with him definitely every single day. And for me, I have to cut, well, I stop everything between 11 and 11.30 at night, bit of a night hour, and I specifically have scheduled in a time for prayer. All right, so whatever I'm doing, 11 o'clock, I close up and I go outside and I focus on a couple of stars in the heavens above. And I just love that time of conversation. And for me, you know, actually scheduling in a specific time is really, really important. We tend to think our relationship should be spontaneous and, and sure, it should be, and that's important too. But you know what? If we don't set a specific time for prayer, it'll just drift by. And that relationship, of course, will be challenged. And of course, even uh, on a Sunday morning in our exhort, uh, does our minds remain active? I mean, how many exhorts have we sat through where we're sort of thinking about, I've got to get this done on Monday and then, you know, Tuesday, we've got this important thing to happen. So our minds sort of drift all over the place. We've got an opportunity this morning to enter into fellowship, close fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ and to commit like Peter. Where is our minds? Well, Malachi 1 verse 13 says, The table of the Lord, what a weariness it is. And here's these disciples, they couldn't keep their eyes open, they fell asleep. And I wonder about ourselves, brothers and sisters, because we look at them, we think, well, you know, if I was there, I'd definitely be awake. But sometimes we can't even survive a Sunday morning exhort before sort of our eyes glaze over a little bit. And sadly, in the time of Malachi, they viewed the table of the Lord as a weariness. Not a moment for introspection and for recommitment. And Paul makes that comment, doesn't he, in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 30? Many are asleep. Many are spiritually asleep. Uh, and if that happened back in the Corinthians times, well, what about ourselves today? So the Lord came back to the disciples three times to seek some strength and support, and he found none. Sad. And then we notice there in verse 42, uh, there's, there's some torches coming through the garden. Uh, there's some lanterns, there's some noise, there's people coming through. Verse 42, the Lord says, rise and let us go. And he takes Peter and the rest of the disciples with him as well. Now, why? Why is that? Why didn't the Lord say, you guys better make a run for it, because this is going to be a bit of a challenging time. You know, seek the safety of the darkness of the garden. He takes he says, right, come on, boys, we've got to go now. And he brings all his disciples forward into this confrontation with these men with, with lanterns and clubs and swords. 
Why? Why did he do that? Because he wanted 11 men to see the treachery of a disciple who made the decision from which he would never, ever recover, Judas. And there's a difference between the word deny and the word betrayal. The word betrayal is used of Judas because it was something permanent. The word denial is used of Peter because it was something that was temporary. And Jesus brought these 11 men with him to see a man who was on the other side. He was with them. And it's something, of course, that John particularly picks up in his gospel record. And he almost says it in, in amazement. So you'll notice there in verse 43 that inserted into the, na the narrative, uh, it says, and immediately while he yet spake cometh Judas. And then obviously John Mark has added this in, one of the twelve just so we get the point. I mean, obviously we knew that, but he's just saying he was one of the 12, but he isn't anymore. It's all in the past tense. And Peter later wrote this, 2 Peter 2.22. He says, There are brothers and sisters that have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, But if they become entangled in the world again, their latter end is worse than the beginning. And he describes them like a pig going back into the mud or a dog eating its vomit. Like quite graphic language, but it's written on the backdrop of what Judas did to the Lord Jesus Christ. So it was a shock to 11 men who saw Judas on that other side, a man who deserted Christ and he never bothered to recover. In fact, what is really horrible is in verse 45. It says, and as soon as he was come, he got, this is Judas, he goes straightway to him and says, Master, Master, and kissed him. Now, the Greek word is cataphilio, cataphilio. It means to smother in kisses. Like this is not one peck on the cheek. This is like an embrace and a cataphilio. So, you know, obviously the disciples perhaps didn't really pick up what was going on. But how distasteful for the Lord Jesus Christ. What a contrast really to the honesty of Peter he was struggling to keep that connection. And the hypocrisy of Judas who covered Jesus in kisses. Just so, so horrible, so distasteful. Well, of course, it all unravels. And you notice in verse 47, oh, verse 46, they, they put their hands on Christ. They're going to take, take him. Uh, and very beautifully, John Mark, who wrote under the auspices of Peter, in verse 47, just says in one of them, you know, I guess Peter didn't want his name, you know, put there particularly in the narrative. But it just says, one of them uh, drew a sword and smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. So, Peter physically defends the Lord Jesus Christ. He was quite serious, wasn't it? Wasn't he? he? He defends the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Peter who walked on the water to Jesus Christ. This is the Peter who said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, when 5,000 people just walked away. This was the man who confessed that he believed Jesus Christ was certainly the Son of God when he saw that process of the transfiguration. And he threw himself against a band of men. A band of men. Well, John 18 and verse 3 says it was a cohort. A cohort came in. Now, numerically, that's 600. <laughs> Not quite 600 men in the Garden of Gethsemane. So um, historians tell us that there was a cohort of 600 men designated, designated as uh, the temple guard. All right, So around the Passover, a very busy time, 600 men were organised to, to protect and look after the temple precincts. So they say probably, I mean, obviously the whole cohort's not going to leave the temple, so they would have divided up. And they suggest that a detachment of about, about one-third, 200 men, would have gone into Gethsemane. Romans obviously nervous about the Passover. It was a time of heightened expectations and rebellion often. So about a third of the cohort, they say, would have gone into the Garden of Gethsemane. That's 200 men. And you notice in verse 43, it says a great multitude with swords and staves. And again, repeat in verse 48, swords and staves. So there's one man with one small dagger against 200 men with clubs and swords. It's pretty definitive as, as to Peter's love for Christ, isn't it? Like he was certainly going to lay his life on the line. He's going to take on 200 people with clubs and swords and defend Christ. Amazing. 
And for Peter, you know, this was a moment that absolutely shocked him. He's trying to figure out what's going on. It's 200 men here, Judas, Judas kissing Jesus, what's going on? And suddenly Jesus is manhandled and he's bundled off. Peter whips out a dagger and he slashes at the servant of the high priest. Just an amazing instant. Um, in fact, only the record in John um, records that it was Peter. All right, we wouldn't know. It just says one of them. In the Gospel of John, he actually records it was Peter. Why does why is John the one? And I think it was in admiration. I think he identified Peter because he was in admiration of a man who stood up for Jesus Christ in a moment of terror. Um, both Luke and John uh, carefully record, and we probably know this, that it was the right ear. They're very specific. It was Malchus's right ear. Well, you know, I've read a few theories that oh, maybe Peter was left-handed. <laughs> but, you know, I guess, you know, whichever way you look at it, he probably could have, you know, slashed down that way with a dagger, would have chopped the right ear of the servant off. Peter would have ended up with blood on his hands. What did he do with that dagger? You know, did he slip it back into his clothing or did he throw it away as Christ suggested? But what's interesting is this uh, servant of the high priest is not just uh, some sort of servant. He's an important person in the high priest's household. And essentially, to strike at him, who was the representative of the high priest, was to strike at the high priest, all right? This isn't just some lowly servant who's used to chopping wood. This is the prestigious servant of the high priest that Peter takes out. And really, it was, a, I guess, a, a statement as to where the priesthood was. So interestingly, uh, when the high priest was inaugurated in Exodus 29 verse 20, it said there was blood put on his right ear to make sure his hearing, of course, was pure, on his right thumb to make sure that his, his hands were involved in, in service, and on his right foot, his right toe. And I sort of wonder when Peter made that slash against the servant, whether you know, the servant reached up and touched him and, and he had blood on his thumb and whether it dripped down onto his right toe, I don't know. Maybe I'm getting a bit carried away with the parallel. But it was a bit like, um, remember David cut off Saul's hem? So this was the royal hem, and this was, uh, they, all, they had what was called zitlets on the four corners uh, to show their, their spiritual awareness. And um, spiritual Israelites had those, a bit of a prayer shawl type of thing, and, and David made that cut off. So it was actually a criticism of Saul's spiritual inadequacies. It wasn't just like he chopped a bit of material off. And so in, in some ways, I guess there's, there's sort of a parallel here. What's interesting about this, when Jesus repaired the ear of the high priest's servant, that's the last healing miracle that's recorded. And there's actually a connection between the first and the last miracles of Jesus Christ. Um, the first and the last. So the first one was the healing of the leprous man in Mark 1, verse 40 and 42, where Jesus said, go and see the priests. And he healed that leprous man. And the process for restoring someone after they'd been leprous is recorded in Leviticus 14 and verse 14. And it said the priest would put blood on the right ear, the right thumb and the right toe and pronounce that leprous man clean. So it's sort of interesting. There's an umbrella and a connection between the first miracle of Christ, leprous man, and the last miracle here where the ear is healed. So what would have you done? If you were standing amongst the disciples, it's dark, there's lantern, there's sword, there's clubs, there's noise. Someone grabs Jesus Christ. Imagine you're standing with those disciples. What would you do? Would you have stood back, just wonder what's going on? Would you have waited? So you can see the level of passion that Peter has for his Lord as he whips out that dagger and he makes a slash because he wants to protect the Lord. He's taken on 200 men and he's fine with that. If he has to die in a pool of blood for Jesus, he's okay with that. I wonder where we sit in our love for, Jew for the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder what sort of commitment we're prepared to make this morning. Are we prepared to make the commitment of Peter this week we will not deny our Lord Jesus Christ because that's Jesus Christ would love that sort of commitment. And it's really what we should be committing because otherwise we're only committing to half-hearted service. Like, I'll give it my best shot this week, but you know what? I'm going to fail. 
So there's, there's a disparity between those two levels of commitment, and that's the challenge of the life of Peter. Well, we know the story. Uh, he, he, he follows behind the group and he comes to the house of Annas. And for Peter's mind, obviously, he'd be pretty confused as to what's going on. You know, he committed himself to the Lord. He was going to follow the Lord. He was going to defend the Lord. The Lord said, put your, your sword away, Peter. We don't want that. And then he's marched off. So Peter's trailing behind and wondering, well, what's going on? What, is, what does Christ want me to do? And he's all confused. He's hesitating. And he comes to the, to the house of the high priest in verse 54. It says there, Peter followed him afar off, even to the palace of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself by the fire. You know, I think even in this instance, we see the passion of the man. He didn't give up in the garden of Gethsemane. He didn't walk home and say, well, I don't know what's going on, but I'll just go home and, you know, I'll figure it out tomorrow. He continued to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And the record says, even to the palace of the high priest, He's just cut the ear off of the servant of the high priest. Like, wow, he goes to his house. Well, you know, we, get, we know the story. It's all dark. He's sitting around this fire. There's a fire of coals there. Ver, um, verse 67, we come to verse 67, and there's going to be three denials. Verse 67, the maid earnestly beheld him. And he that he was with Jesus. So verse 67 says, When she saw Peter warming himself, and she looked upon him and she said, And you, and there's a critical word here, it's the word also. And you also was with Jesus of Nazareth. Why this word also? Well, John 18 and verse 16 says the door was opened at the request of John. So John had already identified himself as a disciple of Christ, and he'd gone in. And when Peter was outside, uh, John gave the authority that Peter could also um, come in. Uh, verse uh, John 18 um, reflects on that particularly. And uh, so there's a, a process of identification there with John uh, and with the Lord Jesus Christ. So in some senses, Peter's still confused. He's outside. He's lurking in the shadows. He doesn't know what he's supposed to do. Um, John 18 and verse 16 uses the same phrase that was used of Judas. John 18 and verse 18 says, and Peter stood with them, with the servants, because like he's in this sort of no-go zone where he could have gone either way. So Peter's uh, a little bit confused. He, he doesn't know what's going on. He moved back into the darkness. And then in verse um, 68, there's this denial, of course, that he doesn't know and he's not associated with Christ. And at the end of verse 68, just makes a simple comment. It says, and the cock crew. Um, what's interesting about that is there's a time marker for us. So, you know, it's not actually a rooster. We might think, oh, what is it? Is it a rooster? How, how did that all happen? Well, no, it's not a rooster at all because both the diaglot, diaglot has a footnote, and the Mishnah has a law that there were no roosters in Jerusalem in the time of the Passover. Uh, and the Latin word for the trumpet watch uh, is the word galakinium. And it, the cock crowing is the Latin as a military signal of a change of guard. So every uh, quarter there would be a change of guard and there would be a trumpet sound and the guard would change. So there's a time marker here for us. Well, we move on to verse 69 and it says, uh, and another maid identifies him as a, a possible witness. Um, and again, Peter denies um, the Lord. He stood up in front of 200 men with swords and clubs, but when it came to a maidservant asking who he was and who, who identified with, he said, no, I, I don't know what you're talking about. So, you know, I guess that's sometimes the story of our lives, isn't it? It's the small inconsistencies in our lives that sometimes became the, become the big issues that we have to face. It's not the big dramatic uh, battlefields where we have to stand up for Christ or we have to give a public lecture and we have to show our support and we all come and, you know, that, that's no problem to us. I'm a Christadelphian. Are you interested in the Bible? Um, we, we can go on to those major battlefields and stand up, but sometimes 
you know, in our quiet, po private moments, they're the times that we fail. And Peter is an illustration of that. Well, the third time's in verse 70, of course. Uh, and there's a third person um, that says, surely you are one of them. In fact, I can identify you by your speech. Your speech betrays you. And that's an interesting little phrase because Brother Harry Whitaker says and makes the comment, as should the speech of every disciple. It's quite a nice comment, and I think you'll probably find in you know, your work environment or maybe school environment that people identify who you are by what you talk about and how you speak and the things you speak on. And for all of us, probably because we're not, you know, we don't have the Aussie language where we drop a swear word in every second or third word, people see, ah, oh, that's a different sort of speech. And we're identified by our speech. It's exactly like Peter here. Your speech betrays you. Well, Peter, of course, lost control in verse 71, sadly. Uh, and he lost control of his, his, his self-discipline in language, and it says he began to swear and to curse. So he used the profanities. He backdropped into fisherman language. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I don't know what how fishermen talk, but I could imagine it'd be pretty guttural. Um, so he, he's desperate now, and he's, he's, he's lost really that self-discipline. He's broken down. He's back into fisherman language. And what's interesting in verse um, 61, at the same time, it says, verse 61, Jesus hurled his peace. So there's two different sort of scenarios playing out here. Now, what's interesting in verse 71, it says there, he, and this word began, like he didn't finish because there was another sound that happened. He began to curse and to swear, but verse 72 he was interrupted by the changing of the guard. So as he began to revert back to fisherman language, the trumpet sound, and there was a military changing of the guard, and subconsciously in Peter's mind, something clicked. Uh, and every gospel record says, as he was saying this, immediately the cock crew or the military alarm sounded. So you can imagine Peter, he's reverted back to fisherman language and the backdrop in the back of his mind, he hears this trumpet sound. He thinks, what am I doing? And it had a snowballing effect. You know, for Peter, he's, his mind is in an absolute turmoil. He said he would stand up for Christ. He would give service above and beyond what all these disciples would give. And he's just heard the third sound of the changing of the guard, and he's not feeling good about himself. And then what happens? Well, we know what happens. It's actually not in Mark's record because, again, Peter wrote or Peter uh, discoursed to John Mark and gave the narrative, and it's missing from this particular record. Back in 2011, I went to Jerusalem uh, for the first time after a long time, and we went to a place called the Wool Museum, or it's called also the Palatial Mansion. It's next to the burnt house of Cathros. And what's particularly interesting is Brother Lane Rittmeyer has done a lot of archaeological work in that particular area. And the uh, archaeologists tell us that there's a lot of stoneware, special stoneware dishes that were used for a ritual of purification by the priests and lots of mikvah baths, again, for a purification process. Uh, the area itself gives a, an exceptional view of the temple area. It sort of looks down onto, onto the Temple Mount area. And Brother Lean uh, Rittmeyer says this is most probably the house of Annas the High Priest. And you can actually go there. And for me, it was a very emotional occasion because we know the story how that Peter had betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ came out and looked at him and Peter, you know, just fell to pieces. And I always had this vision that sort of Peter was over here and way back in the corner of this hall, Jesus would emerge and their eyes would lock. Well, when I got to that wall museum and in that particular area, it was six metres. So from about here to about where I am, Peter would have been standing here and Jesus would have come through that door. You've got nowhere to go. You can't hide. And for me, just a very emotional moment that I realised that they were so close and Peter couldn't help but have his eyeballs locked onto the face of Jesus Christ. It wasn't something in the distance. 
and the door opened. And what happened? Peter's standing here. The door opens. The temple guard comes out and they shove a man out. He's a man who's been ter uh, terribly bruised. He's got spittle hanging off his face. He's got a crown of thorns on his head and there's blood coming down across his forehead. He's been pushed about. Soldiers are slapping the back of his head and he's in incredible agony. And Luke says he turned and he looked at Peter. Looked straight at Peter. He didn't say anything. What an amazing, eloquent moment. And I think Jesus had tears in his eyes. I think as those two men locked together, I think Jesus had tears in his eyes. No verbal reprimand from Jesus to Peter saying, Peter, what are you doing? Pull yourself together, mate. None of that. He just looked, tears in his eyes, and Peter looked at him as well. And you know what's really interesting? In Luke, we won't go to Luke 22. Luke 22 and 62, it says, Peter went out and wept. Verse 64, two verses later, it said they blindfolded Jesus. So here's the point. The last vision Jesus had of Peter was at his lowest point, at his most dismal moment. And as Jesus looked at Peter, the next moment was they blindfolded Christ. So that was his last vision before they blindfolded him, of a man who was struggling in his faith. And Jesus continued down the pathway to the cross for that man. Isn't that encouraging? You know, the last week, the last year, we've all gone through turmoil. Yes, we've denied our Lord Jesus Christ, but our Lord is here in present with us this morning. We're here to remember his life, his gesture, and he wants us to commit to better service. Well, what about Peter's face? You know, John omits the heartbreak of Peter, perhaps because he didn't find any words. He saw the uh, breakdown of his own companion. But you'll notice in verse 72 here, it just simply says, Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him, and he went out and he wept. What's missing? There's no record of the eye contact with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think Peter was still unable to put that into words. I think he found that moment so moving and so challenging that when he was narrating to John Mark, he just couldn't put that into words again. So our Lord Jesus Christ looks at us with all our faults, with all our frailties, with all our promises. And as Paul says, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The beautiful thing about Peter, with the exception of John, was that he was the disciple that stayed the closest to the Lord Jesus Christ, enough to make eye contact. You know, we often look at Peter and we say, well, he denied his Lord. You know, where was his faith? Where was his courage? Where was he, his persistency? Well, you know what? Apart from John, he was the close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Where were the other ten? So, you know, we need to, to, to commend, well, nine actually, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and the connection that he had with Peter. And as the record says... Uh, right there at the end of Mark 14, when he thought thereupon, he went and wept. I think the margin has got abundantly. You can imagine Peter sitting out in the gutter. He's got his head in his hands. He's thinking, what a mess I've made. I promise to be faithful to the Lord, and I've just totally mucked my life up. And he put his head in his hands and wept copiously. And it's in that moment his life was changed. And it's in this moment, brothers and sisters, our life can be changed. Maybe we haven't been as faithful as we committed to when we were first baptised. Maybe this is the moment we've got to say that we're going to follow the Lord on a far better level than we have before. But, you know, this is not the end of the story. It'd be pretty sad if we closed the gospel record up and left Peter, you know, crying in the streets of Jerusalem. You know the next incident? It's in Luke 24, verse 12. We won't go there. Luke 24, verse 12 says... Then arose Peter, and he ran to the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes. So we don't put a full stop on the story here and close our Bibles up, because Peter renewed his strength. He arose, and he ran with John down to the sepulchre, and he beheld the empty tomb. And he was a changed man from then on. You know, when we turn to the book of Acts, it's Peter and John going up to the temple, proclaiming the gospel and the good news to everyone. In that moment of crisis, in that emotion of distress, 
that was the conversion process that was beginning that set him on a pathway toward the kingdom. Proverbs 24, 16 says, A righteous man falls down seven times and he rises again. But the wicked, the wicked stumble in time of calamity. That's us here this morning, brothers and sisters. Maybe we've stumbled through our life. Maybe the last week or the last year we haven't been as faithful and persistent as we should have been. But we have a moment now to commit like Peter did to a service above and beyond what we've given before. Let's think about Peter. Let's think about his enthusiasm, his affirmative uh, support, his devotion as a, as a disciple and his determination as a defender. We've got a moment now to think about our personal commitment and how we want to connect again to our Lord Jesus Christ that in the weeks following, should he not return, we will walk faithfully in his footsteps. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.